And all right, we are live tonight. We are talking about the Fletcher class destroyers again. It's another uh, episode, special episode of Museum Ship Mafia, where we cover the 80th anniversary of the commissioning of a World War II Fletcher class destroyer. Tonight, it's going to be, let me pull the picture up, the USS Johnston, this guy right here. So it's an iconic warship, the destroyer USS Johnston that took part in the Battle of Leyte Gulf, October, 1944. That's what we're gonna be covering tonight. So we're happy to have you join us. My name is Ken Stano with the YouTube channel History X and uh, some other people that you see along the bottom of the screen include uh, Shane Stevenson from the Buffalo Naval Park. He's the uh, third from the left. Um, between the two of us, John Epp, curator, USS Slater out of Albany, New York, YouTube channel. If you want to check out their stuff, simply search for the USS Slater. Next, we got Connor Kilgore out of Thunder Bay, Ontario. And he is also one of the administrators for the Museum Ships Facebook group. He's right in the middle, and he's also going to be working behind the scenes, spinning the dials, pulling the levers, answering your questions, and any comments that you guys have to make. He's the one that's going to make that magic happen. Next is Tim Nesmith, superintendent from the USS Kid out of Baton Rouge, Louisiana. To check out the kids' content, simply go on YouTube and do a search for the USS Kid Veterans Museum, or check out their website, ussskid.com. Next to Tim... Also down in Baton Rouge, you got Park Stevenson. He's been on the show before, always has a lot, uh, a lot of interesting stuff to say. And tonight, of course, since we're talking about the Johnston and he was there, why not have him along? And then uh, last but not least, some guy by the name of Victor Vescovo, who I might as well just dive into it right away. Since, uh, since he was nice enough to join us tonight, Victor, I'm going to just, everyone has to indulge, indulge me here because I need to tell you about this guy. Victor Vescovo out of Dallas, Texas, went to, uh, attended Stanford, got a master's in MIT and an MBA in Harvard. So there's some intelligence there. Uh, served 20 years in the U.S. Navy intelligence, reti retiring in 2013 as a commander. And he's completed what's called the Explorer's Grand Slam. Now, what is that? The Explorer's Grand Slam essentially means that he's reached both North and South Poles, as well as the highest peaks on each of the seven continents, including in 2010. Yes, he was at the, he summited Mount Everest. So Earth's wow. highest, highest point. Taking that a step further, and I find this really interesting. He's also been to the deepest point in each of the world's five oceans. 2019 challenger deep in the mariana trench took him almost seven miles under the water and then in 19 also guinness book of world's record listed him as the one person who has covered the greatest vertical distance on our planet without leaving the surface meaning that he's gone 65,000 feet from the bottom of the deepest point in the oceans to the highest point mount everest that's a little over 12 miles or 20 kilometers um but of course it didn't end there so that's him on top of Mount Everest. Um, he's been diving all over the place, like I just mentioned. But like I said, it didn't end there because in 2022, this guy actually flew to space aboard the New Shepard rocket in the Blue Origin capsule. So with that being said... Um, and he went to Baton Rouge. Rouge. Oh, he's what? And he went to Baton Rouge. Oh, that's that good. Completes, that completes the whole thing. So, Victor, thanks for joining us tonight. Welcome to our broadcast. No, thank you very much, and thanks for the, the kind intro. I didn't expect that. Well, there's an asterisk with each of those things, though, I got to say. I mean, no 10Ks, no half marathons? <laughs> uh, no, I've done some marathons and 10Ks and all that. This guy. All right. Um, so, uh, happy to have you here. Thanks for joining us. But then let's get on to uh, some of his other stuff. Maritime Shipwrecks. Along with Park Stevenson, Victor uh, Victor escorted Parks down to the Titanic. I think it was five times. Is that correct? Our team uh, dove Titanic five times. I dove it uh, three times, and Parks was with me on one of the dives. Gotcha. Gotcha. And Victor was the only one to do it solo. And that was probably the most dangerous dive I ever did. Really? Yep. 
Well, we'll, we'll need to learn a little bit more about that. But I wanted to mention a couple other things here. Um, you also dove to the wreck of the French submarine. Yeah. Is it Minerve twice? Yeah, the Minerve. Yeah, we dove that twice. And uh, there was a bit of a mystery about why it went down. And this isn't a show about the Minerve. But I was able to take down a French admiral that actually commanded that class of ship. And within about uh, an hour of serving the wreckage, we pretty much figured out what happened to it. Oh, okay. So then... So it wasn't even deterred or no one knew what happened to it. Until no, it just vanished. Out. It was about an hour out of port out of Toulon and in the heavy seas, it just basically went under after everything was seemingly okay. So it was a big mystery and they all, they went down with all hands, but we found the wreckage. We were able to find the conning tower and we were able to find, uh, you know, I'll, I'll go ahead and tell you, but it appeared that the snorkel had been snapped by being run over by a container ship. And it caused an uh, influx of water that was so rapid that they couldn't uh, counterbalance mm. it. And they, uh, they went down and then it imploded. Whoa. Okay. I see. I'd never heard of the submarine Minerva until I actually started researching you. So that's, and that was in 2020 that you made that, that uh, those dives, correct? Correct. All right. And then in 2021, what we're going to be talking about tonight, of course, you, uh, both you and parks, you're, discovery of the hull of the USS Johnston followed in 2022 by the discovery of the destroyer escort Samuel B. Roberts. And yes. I mean, all, all super fascinating. I mean, tonight we're going to be talking about, like I said, the, the USS Johnston, but I want to say that for all of you that are watching tonight, because we've got Victor on, because we've got Parks on, they were both there. Send us your questions. Connor in the background will sort them out, try and get them answered. So let us let us know what's on your mind. Real quick, just since you have that picture up, I do want to point out to people, if you look closely at the 40 millimeter gun mount on the right-hand side of the screen, you can actually see the shells loaded. That's not you, something you see on any of the museum ships these days. Yeah, I noticed oh. that too. So for people looking at the screen, what Victor's talking about there, if you look at the top of the gun, uh, a little bit to the left-hand side, you're going to see three white, well, for lack of a better word, white dots. And that's the ammunition he's talking about. Um, it's, it's Yeah, so there was live there was live ordnance on that ship. There were depth charges. The 40 millimeters had the you know ammunition loaded up, 20 millimeters. All, they, that, the ships went down fighting. So that was a very interesting wreck, and we weren't really sure if the uh, – ordinance was still live or not under those pressures and after that long it was anybody's guess what could happen so it was a little mm -hmm. bit tense when we were getting really close to the wreck hedgehogs were there and there was at least a couple of unexploded mark six step charges yep well then i'll tell you what since we're talking about it parks if you don't mind why don't we jump right into it the the uss johnston and you know what? I mean, I'll let I'll let you take over. I've got I got a series of pictures, you know, of the uh, Johnston here you know, being launched. Yeah, if you, 27 October 1943, USS Johnston was launched out of the Seattle Tacoma shipyard. Um, I, I'm sorry, she was launched before then. She was commissioned on 27 October, and that is when Commander Evans brought together a crew that brought um johnston alive i know there's some people that consider birthdays to be the launch dates um in the navy we usually consider the commissioning date to be kind of the birthday for the ship because that is truly the day when the ship comes alive there's mm -hmm. commander evans there he was a um he's, he's a guy who grew up in rural oklahoma and um part of the um um Oh, gosh. Yeah, this is where my words are failing me. Anyway, he uh, enlisted in the Navy, um, got a, a commission to the United States Naval Academy, and uh, then <clears throat> was in a uh, destroyer uh, when in the South China Sea when the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor. His ship, uh, the Alwyn, was uh, involved in some uh, joint expeditions against the Japanese early on. Uh, tasked to protect the British ship's repulse and renown from the Japanese, um, that uh, they were unsuccessful in that and Alwyn had to basically flee from the Japanese onslaught. It was there that Evans 
really firmed up his mantra that uh, if he was ever given command of a fighting ship, he would never run from the enemy. And on the commissioning date here, he told the crew that now that he had a fighting ship, there was no, he, he would never turn and run from the enemy. Uh, he said he was going in harm's way. And if anybody didn't want to follow him there, they were free to get off then. No one did. And just short of a year later, it would become clear um, that he meant what he said on that commissioning date. Um, now, go ahead. I, I got a quick question here. So, I mean, Victor, was it always your intention to go after the Johnston or was this kind of like a fun to do? You know, we're in the area, we're going to look for it. How, how does that work? How did you guys, you know, plan this? Well, one of the nice things about developing and diving this submersible that could go to any depth repeatedly was that it opened up the whole ocean to us. So there were many different things that we were doing scientifically in terms of marine biology, marine geology, but also marine archaeology. So to answer your question, we were trying to go to the bottom of all four of the world's 10,000 meter trenches, the Challenger Deep being, or the Mariana Trench being one of them. But another one that had never been visited was the Philippine Trench, just to the east of the Philippines. And there's a little over 10,000 meters. So there was a scientific interest. So we had an expedition going there. But then I realized, of course, given I love studying military history, that that was the scene of the battle. And I had heard that there had been an expedition by Robert Kraft to find a Johnston and their underwater drones could not go beyond 6,000 meters, but they had found some wreckage that they suspected was the Johnston. So that was a nice confluence of events where we were in the neighborhood, so to speak, doing a scientific mission. We knew generally that there was some wreckage down there, but the main hull had not been found. And yet we had a submersible that was capable of unlimited depth. So we had the right tool and we had the right opportunity to maybe find the Johnston. So I add on to the back of the scientific expedition. So, yeah. Th so these Im images here are from that expedition. They found, like you said, they found bits and pieces, mm -hmm. but they never actually found the hull. And if I understand, or if I remember correctly, I think there was a problem with their ROV and they couldn't go any deeper, but it's not really a problem. It was designed that way. It was only designed to go to 6,000 meters in it. They went down just a little bit below that and they saw a kind of trench dug in this slope where they found the wreckage. So there was a pretty good suspicion that there was a larger piece of wreckage down below, but the ROV by design couldn't go down any deeper. They would risk having that very expensive piece of equipment implode. But I, I imagine they didn't share much in the way of information with you. So you, you, Unless no. I'm wrong, you guys probably, it, Parks, you had to do some detective work to figure out where to look, right? Yeah, we had, um, <clears throat> excuse me, myself with uh, Anthony Tully and Rob Lundgren had reworked the uh, battle tracks of the battle uh, mm -hmm. using American and Japanese resources, cross-checking between the two to try and identify um, where the ships were in relationships to each other. The problem with that is that then we had a map of spatial relationships between the different ships, but we didn't know where that map was anchored. So when Vulcan found the debris field, uh, they thought it was either Johnston or Hull, uh, a sister ship to Johnston, which also sank that same day. And uh, um, looking at their imagery, and then coming out to the kid, that was my first exposure to the kid. Uh, Victor and I flew out in May of 2020, right during the height of the pandemic. Victor flew his helicopter directly into Baton Rouge, and we went to the kid, which was closed down to the pandemic at the time. And um, based on conversations with Tim aboard the ship, we identified this one beam, this one uniquely shaped beam uh, aft of uh, Mount 54, that showed up in the wreckage of one of the mounts in the Vulcan um, imagery. That mount had an intact barrel, and we knew from the battle reports that Hull had taken a Japanese shell, uh, hit the barrel of her Mount 54 and broke it in half. And once that was identified, we knew that we had Johnston. Then other clues would come up too. Uh, there was some wreckage with uh, navy blue 5M paint 
There was the training ring from Mount 55 ripped out of the main deck. It was undamaged aside from being ripped out of the main deck. And we knew from Hole's battle account that she took a shell right onto her training ring, which froze her 55 mount in train. And so we knew we had Johnston. But again, where was Johnston? Um, pressure drop had transited the area the year before and had created a very high resolution uh, bathothermic map of the ocean bottom. And so we started to look possible uh, likely places that we could find. And, and, and it, was, it was very tricky because we were looking at the edge of the trench in the Philippine Sea. In other words, uh, the wreck could be at 6,000 meters. It could be at 9,000 meters. Now, Vulcan had found wreckage at 6,000 meters, <clears throat> and it could have been close to the edge where the, the hull, uh, and, and like Victor said, there was a, there was a mark where a, a large body had slid down a slope, could have gone all the way down to 9,000 meters. We, we had no idea. But we needed to find the debris field that Vulcan had found. We needed to refine that. And uh, the only thing that we had as far as information from Vulcan was, was the depth of that debris field. And based upon that depth line, and that, that narrows it down to 20 nautical miles, basically, where the wreckage could have been, 20 nautical miles is still too large an area to cover when you don't have a large area search capability and uh, a little bit of history, a little bit of information from Vulcan, but then a whole ton of luck put us uh, where we could, we, we would run across, where Victor would run across the, um, the edge of the debris field on uh, the third dive. And uh, from there found the, uh, the, the, the mark, the, the slide area down the slope and pressure drop was able to go down the slope and and then Victor saw, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll let Victor take, take it from here. I'll just interject real quick, a common question we get is, well, if you were able to make a map of the seafloor, why didn't you just use the sonar on the ship to find the wreck? You can't because to a sonar, especially operating at that extreme range of 6,000, 8,000 meters, a rock looks like a piece of wreckage and a ship can look like a big ridge or something like that. You can't differentiate it. And many people sometimes think that sonar can detect differences between rock, sand, and metal. Well, they can't. They're just bouncing sound waves off of anything. Now, when you get really close with a very short range sonar, metal does give off a little bit of a harder return. So you get a little bit of differentiation, but, but not a lot. So we had to physically get it. But the key piece of information was that Vulcan in the open source published the depth that they found that wreckage. So we basically drew a line on the bathymetric chart of where that would be. And then we had to decide whether to go north or go south along that line in a general area. And so in the first couple of dives, we kind of went the wrong direction and then we changed direction. And that's when we picked up the blood trail of the wreckage and were able to find the debris field. And once we found the debris field, we were then able to locate the trench that the majority of the wreck dug as it slid down another several hundred meters. Although to be quite frank, we had no idea how deep it went down. I mean, we were joking in the sub on the way down, we said, you know, we could be doing this for a thousand meters, but uh, eventually we did find it and it had not just come to rest, but it was unusual because the bow was pointing back up slope. So Parks and I have gone back and forth on how that could be. Did it, did it slide down backwards or did it slide down bow first, which would, which didn't look like it did from the type of the trench that it cut. And then when it kind of got a little bit shallower, maybe it pivoted 180 degrees, had a lot of energy. I don't know. But what I do know is it was amazing going down this trench, going down the ravine where the ship had cut and then seeing it front on. The first thing we saw was the bow. And so the very first thing that we did when we were almost out of power, we'd been down there many, many hours was let's get to the bow. Can we see the number and get a hard confirmation that it was the Johnston? And it was. So we only had about, uh, we were only able to do one circuit around the ship in about 20 minutes before the batteries were just completely done on that trip. So then we came back up, but we had hard visual identification of the wreck. And then we recharged the submersible and we went down a second time to survey it. And I did that with parks. But since we generally knew where it was, we had a lot more time on that trip. So we made two dives to the Johnson, the discovery dive, which was very brief, and then a survey dive with parks. And, and to show how 
how difficult it is to find a wreck in the deep ocean, even though they found the Johnston the day before, uh, it still took us an hour to refind it the next day. Yeah, it's the ocean is really, really, really big. It's very difficult to find anything on the seafloor. And the best analogy I can make is go into a national park with a flashlight and then try and find something. <laughs> And that's all you got. That's pretty similar because the maximum range of the sonar on the submersible is about 120 meters. That's it. And so, you know, it's a little bit of blind man's bluff and a lot of luck was involved, but we were very fortunate. And Johnston, Johnston was shielded by the topography down there. One yeah. of the reasons why Vulcan never picked up the main body, either optically or on her sonar. Um, look, looking at um, the sonar map that... Uh, the Vulcan would share later, Johnston lay in a black area. It, and that was basically an area of shadow to her sonar. Um, they never, they never saw, they never picked it up on sonar. Yeah. When, when you pick it up one day and then you try and go down the next day and you can't find it and you're spending an hour looking for it, doesn't that create a certain level of frustration or you think, <laughs> well, I, I guess I'm trying to put it nicely here. Let me put it this way. If me and Shane were in his car and we were trying to find a restaurant, I would immediately get frustrated at, at Shane if we couldn't find it. Well, no, you just have to be systematic. I mean, at that point, we knew exactly what depth the main wreck was. So we just had to get back to that elevation and then, you know, work the line. But the issue that you have, especially when you're diving down to you know, that level of depth, you know, 6,000 plus meters, you drift and at, at that point in time we weren't able to really identify where the sub was when it was on its way down so it's like uh, parachuting out of an airplane and you're at twenty thousand feet you know the wind's going to carry you so where you land on the bottom isn't necessarily where you started and so mm -hmm. then you've got to kind of backtrack and then try and figure out which way is north as i as parks heard me say any number of times on any number of my dives things can get very confusing down there when you're at the ultra deep levels this is not like going on scuba where you've got light, where you kind of know where you are. There's not a lot of drift. We're, it took us two plus hours to descend to that depth. That's a lot of time. And some of those currents are strong. What do you, what do you talk about? Or let me ask you this. What's it like being in a submersible with parks? <laughs> you become a very good listener. <laughs> <laughs> got it. So, uh, so you guys are. Imagine being you know, trapped in a small room with me for eight hours. Yeah, and it's uh, oh, I don't have to there, imagine. Are there are there two or three people on board? The two people, pilot and a uh, specialist. So just just two people. Right. It's like sitting in the cockpit of a business jet. It's okay. Compact, but it's not uncomfortable. You can't stand up, but you can crouch, and you know it's reasonably comfortable. It just gets cold. People don't realize that you're in a titanium ball and it's freezing in the deep ocean. You know, it chills it down. Then people say, well, why don't you just put heaters in there. Well, the issue there is that they have to be electric. You're not going to have an open flame and they're very inefficient. And so that would rob a lot of power from the batteries that you want to use to actually power the thrusters to cover more ground. So you just bundle up, but it does get a little bit cool in there. And your toes are frozen. Parks, if I remember the last time or one of the times we had you on, you did, do I remember correctly? It's about a seven or an eight hour Trip. Well, total, total mission time can be about eight hours. Okay. Well, you, that's, that's, you, well that, that, that's to the Johnson, to the absolute bottom of the ocean, the Challenger deep. That's about a 12 or 13 hour mission because it takes four and a half hours to get down a couple hours on the bottom whoa. and then four hours back up. Yeah. It's a long day. Yeah. And then, and then how long to recharge the batteries uh, so you can do it again? Overnight. Oh yeah. Yep. Okay. Um, plus, other, plus other inspections too, you know, when you oh, take. Yeah. Yeah, when you take a vehicle that down in the depth, you always want to check it over when it comes back. Mm -hmm. uh, before we move on, because I want to have Parks kind of talk us through some of these pictures, and Victor, you too. Um, but before we move on, uh, John from the USS Slater, Shane from the Buffalo Naval Park, uh, Connor, did you guys have any questions for these two? Did you find any life down there? Any any fish? Anything like that? Well, there's microscopic life. But what was interesting, when you when you go to Titanic, which is about 4,000 meters, there's a lot of life on the ship, a lot of incrustations, because there's still some oxygen at that level. When you get down below past 5,500 meters and definitely below 6,000 meters, most of the oxygen is gone. 
And so that's when you look at these wrecks, they look almost pristine, like they were when they went down. And it's because there's really no rust because there's no oxygen and there's no animals because there's no oxygen. And so they're very well preserved. Yeah, there's Titanic encrusted with so-called rusticles that are eating the iron that uh, the ship was made out of. But you don't see that on the Johnston or the Samuel B. Roberts because there's no oxygen. Yeah, the only the only real corrosion you would see, and I, I call it corrosion, it may not really be corrosion, was where the ship was damaged or burned during battle before she sank. You yeah. see her uh, hull number there is on a strake that was undamaged, and it looks as freshly painted as it was in 1944. Yep. But if we go to a picture like this, let me see if I can find this. Andy um, B. Roberts looks so... Well, okay, so here... There was there there was um, there was damage there. Um, there was fire. Uh, you can see the whaleboat davit mm -hmm. is sticking into the captain's import cabin. That's yeah, that's it. And um, um, everything's <laughs> everything's relatively intact except where it suffered damage during the battle. I mean, you're going to get some organics, but if you compare this to the Titanic, it's night and day. Yeah. And when you went to the Titanic, that had been, what was it, like 14 or 15 years before any, or after anyone had been down there for a period of time? So you guys were down there to kind of survey what the extent of the, uh, or what the uh, condition of the wreck was, correct? Right. It was the first manned mission in 15 years. There had been an earlier one that uh, had used robots, but we were the first people to actually be on site down at the wreck in 15 years. And yeah, that was the objective. And we did it with Nat Ge uh, National Geographic and with NOAA, and they wanted to know what the condition of the wreck was. And we did some scientific uh, collection as well. Yeah, I had been on the previous manned mission, and so it was 14 years between the two. And then in 2010 was an extensive mapping uh, expedition just using ROVs. So nobody had seen that wreck in nine years. Hey, Parks, uh, did you notice any difference between the two wrecks in terms of Rusticles. The two wrecks, you mean between Titanic and Johnston? No, between Titanic, in between. Oh, in between visits. Oh, yes. Yes. It's a continual degradation on that wreck. Okay. She, and, and actually, we talk about corrosion and we talk about the rusticles. I actually think that uh, a, lot of the, a lot of the damage on Titanic is more due to erosion. Um, she's at a confluence of the Gulf Stream and the Labrador Current. And the currents can be very, uh, very strong at times. And I've seen, um, if, you, if you look at the, the pattern of damage to the Titanic wreck, the, the port side, which is primarily facing against the, the force of the current, is a lot more um, damaged than, uh, than, the, than the starboard side. Starboard side is a little bit more sheltered. Um, mm -hmm. The steel uh, in the deck houses have been over time worn down to where they're they're paper thin and i remember lifting off the wreck in 2005 and going past a, a portion of the grand staircase overhead that had been um what is it three eighths inch steel i believe I, I forget but it was it was fluttering like gauze in the current it, it had become that thin and that's where you start to see this progressive collapse in the lighter steel of the deck houses, but you don't see anything like that on a on a, on a down in the Hadle Deep in this environment on Johnston or uh, Sammy B. Yeah, but that, that, yeah, that comment parks about the current. That's that relates back to the comment I made earlier about the Titanic being the most dangerous dive I ever did. It was because the currents of Titanic could be so strong. On the solo dive that I did, it was about almost a knot to a knot and a half current. And the reason why that's important is that that's the, also the maximum speed of the submersible. So at times, just to hold position, I was at maximum power. And if the current ever moved in an odd way, which it does a lot around Titanic because of all the structures, it can push you into the wreck. And the number one danger that you have when you're diving a wreck is entanglement from the cables, whether they're steel or even you know rope, because you can't go out and untangle yourself. And if you get entangled in a wreck, it's a really, really bad day. 
So that's why the Titanic wreck, especially being solo, which I probably not the best idea I ever had. You have to have your you have to have your eyes inside the submarine, looking at the sonar and looking at your instruments to make sure everything's okay. But you also really need to be looking outside, and so you're constantly switching your gaze between inside and outside, and you might miss something. So that was a a pretty nerve wracking dive. The Johnston and the uh, Samuel B. Roberts, the currents were much more sedate, and so it wasn't as dangerous. What? Why on earth do a solo? dive <laughs> well no one had ever done it and um yeah i get asked a lot why would i because i dove the submarine quite a bit solo in the early days one i was being a test pilot i didn't want to risk a passenger you know and i could take risks with the submersible when we were perfecting it that i would take but i would never take when i had someone else in the sub and honestly i wanted to go down titanic because no one had done it and i get a lot of satisfaction just by having me my machine, machine and then you know a wreck or something historical or even a trench. It's just me in the environment. You know, I like to climb mountains solo as well. That's just part of it. So mm -hmm. it's a personal thing. And it was it was a really special experience to be down at the Titanic, just me in my sub with the wreck, no one else. It was intense. When you when you built the submersible or when you had the idea of building it, was it to look for shipwrecks? No. Or was it to get to the bottom of the five oceans? It was primarily designed as a technological demonstrator. Before we built and started diving the submersible limiting factor, only two missions had ever gone down to the bottom of the ocean in neither of those submarines, the Trieste in 1960 and James Cameron's Deep Sea Challenger in 2012. They never went down again. In fact, the Deep Sea Challenger never dove again at all. So it was a big deal technologically to build a vessel that could repeatedly go down to the bottom of the ocean, which basically means you can go anywhere on the seafloor, but also make it very reliable where you could dive it every other day. That just hadn't existed before. So it was really a technology demonstrator that we also packed in a lot of scientific capability because it was meant to be a scientific tool. It was not designed as a wreck finder, although it's so capable that that was just something that we were able to do and given that I'm a big fan of military history and I'm a former naval officer, those missions came later saying, hey, I, you know, that would be another thing to show the capabilities of this system. We can find deep ocean shipwrecks. Yeah, not to, not to um, denigrate limiting factor in any way, but um, it's no, obvious no. that she's not <laughs> the ideal shipwreck analysis machine. Um, she, she was obviously designed to go to the deepest part of the oceans and, and her viewports are set up that way. Uh, everything about her is set up that way. It was a little bit of a challenge to, you know, view and analyze a shipwreck from limiting factor. But then again, it was the only vehicle in the world, the only vehicle available that could, that could allow a manned mission down that deep. So, um, uh, you know, you make me make do with what you with, with what you have. The next generation of submersibles are going, uh, are, I, if I can say, Victor, are going to be a, a, accommodate shipwreck exploration and search a little bit better. Well, yeah, I'm actually I'm trying to design uh, the next generation a submersible that will be even more capable than the living factor. And we learned so much in deploying that one for four straight years that, yes, there would be enhancements to the submersible that would make it a much, much more capable wreck finding and wreck surveying device, along with being do even more science with better cameras, with a wide, a wider sonar, longer range sonar, all sorts of things that we can do to improve it. But uh, other people ask, why don't people just use ROVs to go down and look for these wrecks? You know, they're, they're cheaper. And well, the issue is they can't go that deep because think they have to have a cable attached to them for communication and power. That's a long cable. We're talking like four or five miles, and it now becomes a really expensive piece of kit. So there are actually technical limitations to having ROVs go down below 6,000 meters. Well, then people say, why not just use you know AI or autonomous machines to go down and survey these wrecks? Well, you know, when you're going down and you wanna get up close to get really good pictures of a wreck, you know, machines aren't really good at that. Humans are. We're really good at dynamically assessing a situation and not running into it or getting blown up by some of the munitions on board. So there are missions that are best suited to a human occupied vehicle and diving these really deep wrecks. It happens to be one of them. Mm -hmm. 
one one of the questions that I had a while ago when um when Parks had uh, been on with us before was it seemed like this was the end of the discoveries, you know, when it came to the Samuel B. Roberts, um, the whole, the Gambier Bay still hadn't been discovered. And my question was, well, is anyone going to be looking for these? And Park's answer was, well, no, because pressure drop, you, you know, if it wasn't operating and I think you were thinking about selling it at the time, you know, it's like, so no, there wasn't another vessel out there that could do it. But then you just said a few moments ago that you're working on the next generation. Yeah, that'll take about three or four years to design and build a next generation submersible. That's how long it took to do the first one. But I see this question come up and there were really only two people really passionate about finding deep ocean shipwrecks, particularly military ones. And that was um, the former founder of uh, Microsoft, uh, um, uh, Vulcan, I'm blanking on his name, apologies. And uh, he pa passed away. So that- Paul Allen. That, yeah. Oh yeah, that, yeah, Paul that, Allen, right. Yeah, Paul Allen. So he passed and that funding went away. Look, what- people need to understand it is extremely expensive to operate deep ocean research vessels and so i did this all on my own there was no funding for it i didn't partner with discovery channel or national geographic or someone because that's has its own issues so i just funded it and now that i've sold the system and got a lot of my capital back so i can keep doing the technological development which is really the primary motivation that i have for doing uh, marine activities is to push the technology forward is uh, yeah, I don't know that there's anyone out there that's willing to fund it, and it's mm -hmm. really, really expensive. Well, Forbes Forbes mentioned in an article that the submersible itself was thirty million. Is that accurate? More. No, it was more. It was more. All yeah. right, and then Forbes mentioned also that um, the vessel, the support vessel here. Let me pull it up here. Pressure yeah, pressure, uh, drop. pressure drop was uh, was twenty million. Yeah, that, that does, that's about right. But the real kicker is the operating cost. Yeah. Ships are operated 24-7, 365. And that meter, it's like being in a, the, the world's most expensive taxi. And that meter never stops. So that, that's really the killer. And we were running it hard for four years, doing all these scientific missions all around the world, and then doing spec dives as well. So yeah, it, it, it can get pretty expensive pretty darn fast. So when you when you go down there the next day, you can't find it for an hour or so. Is that in the back of your mind thinking it's like we're just we're wasting battery, we're wasting dollars, we're wasting people's no, time? No, you got to be patient. Uh, I mean, I was a hardcore mountain climber for 25 years and you have to be patient. You know, you're going to have bad weather days. You're going to have things go wrong. It's part of exploration. And if you're not a patient person, you should not be involved in exploration. You're going to have dry holes. You're not going to have permits uh, agreed to. You're not going to have something work on a good day. You know, we actually went to Titanic twice. The first time Parks and I went out to Titanic, we didn't even die because a hurricane came up and prevented us from ever deploying the submarine. So we had to come back two years later. So you just have to take it in stride. And, I, you know, I always get asked about, especially about Titanic, what are you thinking about when you're down there? Isn't it just amazing to be there? Um, and you're, you're asking, well, what do you think when you're not finding it? Are you worried and stuff like this? When you're in a dive like that, you are totally focused on the mission. Uh, I'm, I'm the data acquisition guy. I've, I've got my eyes out the whole time. There's no time. Uh, emotion doesn't come in to play during that time. Uh, when we were down there for an hour looking for Johnston, we were looking for Johnston. We had no thought about, oh my gosh, where are we going to find it? Um, the only thought was, what, what route do we take next to find it? Where we, we, you're just you're just thinking about getting to the wreck. You're not worried about all that stuff. All that stuff comes later. And and uh, but the whole time that you're down there, you are focused on why you're down there. Otherwise, it's a waste of time. Well, then let's go through these photos. These are photos, images that you provided to me a long time ago. Almost. Um, geez, could it have been? Well, nine, nine months ago. Oh, it was. Yeah. Anyway, it's it's yeah. funny that you you they show the the bow of Johnston on the right there. Um, I was showing the ship to a guy today, and I walked up on the bow with him, and I was I was I was telling him about the ship, and uh, walking up on the bow, I said, uh, "Well, this is just your typical bow," but I, I swear every time I walk up on the bow of Kid, I I always think of I'm hovering 
just up there looking down on this. That's what Bow of Johnston always means to, or Bow of Kid means to me, is this picture that I took uh, down the bottom. Uh, that's that's from the viewport, and the limiting factor looks straight down onto the bow of Johnston, and they're identical. So it's a little little surreal. Uh, every day that I walk the decks of the kid, I'm also walking the decks of Johnston as well. Um, but anyway, uh, would you like to talk about these? There's uh, the forward two mounts, uh, mount 51 and 52. Uh, the numbers, uh, the first five indicates it's uh, it's five inch gun. And then they're numbered one, two, three, four, five on the way back as the Fletchers were, were set up. Um, Johnston's mounts are pointed to starboard. Uh, they were taken out about an hour before uh, the ship went down. Um, and in fact, in that picture right there, if you look at the side of Mount 52, you will see a hole. That is where a shell went into the mount and just about killed everybody in there, went out the back side of the mount and exploded. Um, 40 millimeter mount, that's the forward um, uh, 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 starboard 40 millimeter mount mount and because it's a 40 millimeter it starts with a four so that's mount 41. you can now see the am ammunition um lockers below the uh, five inch mount are all burned out mm -hmm. um that was that was a huge fire in that area and during the battle uh late in the battle that fire would drive commander evans from the bridge and that's when he would go back aft and stand over a scuttle leading down to the aft steering room, giving steering commands to the ship from back aft. Are you guys, when you're down there and you discover, well, you relocate the hull, I mean, you're, you're, you're taking video, you're taking pictures, but are you able to actually stop and think or notice or make a conclusion? Oh, wow, there's a hull in the side of that gun mount. Uh, no, that, I know where, I know where you're going. Uh, a lot of times you don't see all this detail. Okay. I had to watch the imagery multiple times before I could start to pull details out. Um, you, 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 you try to get as much as you can when you're down there, but you can't see everything all at well, once. Well, you see the big stuff. Like one of the first things I was curious were the torpedo tubes on the Johnston and they were all empty. So when people said they shot all their torpedoes, yes, they did, because they were indeed empty. Or when you were looking at the wreck of the Samuel B. Roberts, yeah, it got hit by a huge shell that shattered the back, because we saw the back part of the ship broken in half. So the big stuff you catch, but I think Parks is right. You know, you go over this imagery that the sub takes over and over and again, and you start noticing little details. And that's why it was frustrating being the pilot of the submersible, because you wanted to get really, really close to get detail, but the closer you got, the more danger you were putting yourself in because there was the risk of a you know, sudden current kind of pushing you into the wreck. You, you do not want to touch the wreck. And, and there was, as I mentioned earlier, live ordnance. So you know, these things are unpredictable and no one had ever been there before. So you don't know what surprises they hold. Well, and when you look at this picture here, you're pretty damn yeah, close to the wreck. I really wanted to get a good picture of the, of the number and, and just see what kind of uh, erosion that it had. And you can just see after 80 years underwater at, you know, 6,000 meters, it's bright as maybe when it went down. So yeah, there were a couple of times where I just, I said, screw it. I'm going to try and get in really, really close. Uh, that'll buff out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. We got some areas on the kid that are in worse condition than that, but, uh, <laughs> but, but we're going to dry dock soon, so we'll get it fixed. Uh, this is the starboard midships of uh, uh, 40 millimeter mount. Uh, this is uh, a mount 44. And it's, um, we can see where the, uh, the guns pointed aft and just below where the guns are pointing aft, you can see what was the 40 millimeter uh, ammunition locker. A shell went in there and just blew it out. Um, this evidently happened late in the battle. Uh, when when Johnston was surrounded by Japanese destroyers who were just taking pot shots at her, um, because uh, we don't have any evidence that there was a huge explosion here at that you know uh, when when people are were giving eyewitness descriptions, uh, the amidships mounts were taken out at the beginning of the battle when a uh, um, when one of Yamato's shells went into the aft engine room and aft boiler room 
and uh, blew debris up the number two stack that fell onto the two um, 40 millimeter mounts on either side and basically took them out of the action. Although there, when, when you have a destroyer going up against four battleships and six cruisers, um, there's not much that, that, that those small 40 millimeter and 20 millimeter mounts can do. In fact, it's almost not much that five inch mount can do. Um, this really highlights the mismatch of that battle. You've got, you've got Taffy threes, destroyer escorts, destroyer escorts, not and a destroyer escort escorting. Um, that went up against these uh, battleships, mm -hmm. five inch, three inch guns against 14, uh, 18 inch guns. No, and I don't, um, think it's, I don't think it's a wise tale, but if you actually weighed a single turret from the battleship Yamato, it weighed more than the sum total weight of the four Fletcher class destroyers. Oh, sorry. Well, no, it, it, it weighed more than Johnson. The whole Okay. One, one, one Fletcher. One Fletcher class destroyer, right. A single turret. Yeah, so it's just extraordinary the mismatch that happened. But it wasn't necessarily important that they be able to take out these ships. They distracted and irritated the Japanese for so long and caused them to do a stern chase that they ate up all the time that the Japanese had. And eventually they got so frustrated that they, and they did a lot of damage, quite frankly, with their torpedoes that uh, they left. One thing that you will learn in these military uh, engagements is logistics, logistics, logistics. Mo um, uh, most of the time, logistics will determine the success or failure of a battle or, or at the very least a campaign. The Japanese, when they uh, enacted Operation Shogo um, to interdict MacArthur's liberation of the Philippines, uh, they did not plan a logistics train as part of that. They had all strikers and no resupply. So um, when Admiral Kurata came through the San Bernardino Strait on the morning of October 25th, 1944, he was expecting to have a clear run down to Leyte Gulf beachhead where he would shell the beachhead with the big guns that he brought with him. He did not expect to see uh, a task force in front of him and uh, at first he thought it was Halsey's third fleet carriers because the Japanese didn't know that we had these little Jeep carriers, these baby carriers, the CVEs, um, which is which caused, first of all, caused Kurata to panic and uh, order basically an all out attack. It was, the Japanese attack was not coordinated in the least. It's just like everybody go for it. The cruisers went in first because they were the fastest. The destroyers ranged out to the west to try and flank the carriers. And, um, and then the battleships kind of lumbered on in uh, with uh, Yamato and Nagato hanging back as basically their command center. Um, Johnston, Commander Evans aboard the Johnston would size this up. And, and even before orders were sent out from uh, the, the task unit commander, Admiral Sprague uh, of Taffy 3, he turned toward the nearest threat, which was the cruiser line coming down, led by the Japanese cruiser Kumano. He would aim right for her, drive as close as he could into her, and then fire all 10 of his torpedoes in one spread, uh, hoping to take out the lead cruiser, which he did. Blew the bow off Kumano. Kumano came to a dead stop, and her sister ship Suzuya stopped alongside to assist. In that one action, uh, Johnston had stalled the, the first and most immediate threat to Taffy 3 by an Admiral Sprague time to make a, to, to put Taffy 3 on a getaway course. And that's what uh, Evans would do for the rest of the battle. He would be where the Japanese were trying to get to and act as a spoiler, taking hits along the way until he could take no more. And eventually Johnston sank. But what he what he did was he chewed up time, he chewed up the uh, Japanese fuel and ammunition. And at a certain point, Kurata had to say, I have no resupply. I've expended this much ordnance, this much fuel. Um, I can't really complete the mission as we planned. And he did a recall and the Japanese turned and retreated. So like Victor said, 
yeah, destroyer, Fletcher class destroyer against a bevy of battleships and cruisers and destroyers can't slug it out gun for gun. But Evans beat the Japanese by eating up their time and their logistics. When you uh, talk about the Titanic, everyone uh, talks about the shoes, the pairs of shoes that are left behind. You know, there's all kinds of evidence of the passengers and, and crew. What evidence did you guys find or notice that you can share about the crew on the Johnston? Nothing. I, I personally don't recall seeing anything that was a uniform or shoes or anything. I think part of it may be that it, there's, you know, another 30 or 40 percent more pressure at the Johnston than there was a Titanic. So that salt water was just pushed into anything remotely organic and it would degrade it and it would dissolve it. So there was nothing. Yeah. And just like Titanic, there are no bodies there. And, uh, but I didn't even see any clothes there. Did you park? Well, I want to say, and this question comes up all the time. I have never seen human remains at a wreck site um, to this day. I know, I know that human remains have been found in some shallow water wrecks like the Hunley, uh, the U-166 and some others. Um, but in these deep ocean wrecks, I, I haven't seen any human remains in Titanic. You mentioned the shoes. I actually argue against a lot of it. Uh, most of the examples of shoes I see are not actually in a natural position. And you got to realize Titanic was a passenger liner who had a lot of luggage. Uh, that stuff all spilled out in her fall to the ocean floor. Titanic fell two miles, two and a half miles, Johnston and uh, Sammy B., uh, almost double that as a ship is as, as, as a ship that is fully flooded, fully equalized as she's going down, you've got a lot of water flowing across and through that wreck. Um, anything lightweight is usually washed out on the fall down to the bottom and deposited on the ocean floor. In the case of Johnston in her debris field, uh, looking th as, 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 I, I, going through both the Vulcan's imagery and our own, the only human evidence I saw were two helmets. Now, I cannot say that they were attached to a body because helmets were um, uh, mounted around the ship. They were helmet bales around the uh, gun mounts. Um, who knows where the helmet came from? It's just another piece of debris from the ship. But as far as something that you could identify saying definitely there's a body there. I've only seen one instance, not at Johnston or, or, but at Titanic, I've seen only one instance where it, it probably does indicate that a body landed there. And I, when I say landed there, I mean, the person didn't die on that spot on the ship. These shoes were found on the ship, but in a place where a person wouldn't have been, a body had to have settled in that place. And then and then wasted away. So no, we haven't seen any of these. Um, at, after uh, all right, who's got the dog? What? All right. Um, so after you guys complete this expedition and come back home, how do you how do you deal with the excitement or the high that you get? I mean, Victor, let's just say you're you're flying back, you're you're in you're in the middle seat of a coach, and you know, how do you not tell people about this? You know, hey, I was just at the Titanic, or I just discovered the deepest shipwreck known to man. Um, I mean, how do you guys handle that? Well, I mean, when we discovered the Johnston and then the Sammy B. Roberts or any other major discovery, including scientific ones, we could actually broadcast the ship. We were able to get media uh, material out and, you know, it was widely covered. In fact, the largest number of views that we had on our YouTube channel, Caledon Oceanic, was from finding the Johnston and the Sammy B. Roberts. So we got it out there. But the other part of your question is like, how do we personally deal with it? I think. I just got to take it in stride. I mean, I don't, people usually don't believe me, but I don't do this to, you know, to be famous or to go, oh, look what I did kind of thing. I do it because I, I really believe and enjoy executing the missions and pushing this technology that we did. Now it's, I mean, 
before we started diving this vessel, there had been two trips to the bottom of Chandra Deep and only three people had ever been there. And more people had walked on the moon than had ever been at the bottom of the ocean. Well, that's not true anymore. We've done over 25 missions to Challenger Deep and over 20 people have been down there now. That's what I, that's to me the legacy I want to do, which is pushing the technology forward. So along the way, having some great missions like finding the Johnston or going to Titanic. Yeah, it's great. If people ask me about it, I'll tell them all about it or give an interview like we're doing here now. But it's not something that really drives me. I'm much more, I'm much more of a nerd. I just want to push the text. Yeah, well, that's that's the best thing about di uh, diving with Victor. He 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 geeks out with me. Uh, we we have some good geek out sessions. And speaking for myself, coming off the mission is the beginning of my work. Um, I have to do the analysis, and so I go right from the dive into the analysis of the wreck, and that takes me months, if not years. I still haven't finished the Sammy B. Roberts analysis yet. Of course, another ship, the USS Kid, kind of got in the way, but I'll get there eventually. Yeah, I have the best job. I, I just get to pilot the sub and go on these awesome missions. But then, you know, when you're writing the checks, I guess you can pick what role you do. <laughs> when, um, I mean, Victor, you've been with us uh, since we uh, kicked off this broadcast. So I want to be sensitive to your time, but I wonder if you'd be able to uh, let people know uh, where you were today. Yeah, that's a, a great point. Actually, this morning, I was at Arlington National Cemetery. The family of the last survivor of the USS Johnston, Carlos Cerna, passed away several months ago. And this morning in Washington, D.C., he was interned uh, with full military honors. There was a rifle squad. He had a three-gun salute. There was a Navy chaplain. There was a Navy bugler that paid, played taps. His extended family was there, not just his children, but his grandchildren and his great grandchildren. And this was a man that was blown off the deck of the Johnston in the final part of the battle, went into the water, was in the water for 52 hours and saw many of his shipmates be killed or dragged underwater by sharks or barracuda. And he survived. And to see his whole extended family there paying tribute to them and yeah, the people were crying and they obviously cared deeply for this man who lived to be 101 years old, but he was the last man. And uh, the family invited me there because they told me that it was appropriate for me to be there as a naval officer and as the person who discovered the ship that he served on that was such a big part of his life. And they told me that he was aware even at the age of 100, when we discovered the Johnston, that we had indeed found it. And they said it made him so happy that we had found the wreck. And that kind of moved me as well. And so uh, for this morning, I was part of that extended family. And I, I think it just helped things come full circle, where this 23-year-old individual who's a radio man, who was in his bunk when the battle started, but obviously then went to his battle station and fought as a radio operator, you know, then we found the wreck, you know, almost 80 years later. And that was a part of that. And we were all Navy family. And uh, it was a very moving experience. Was he the only survivor that was around when you actually made the discovery? Yes. He was the only one. Mm -hmm. oh. And I did actually speak with him on the phone, but, you know, he had a hard time hearing me. He had a hard time understanding what I was saying. But I was told by his family that they, they showed him the pictures of the ship from the mission that Parks and I went on. And they said that, yeah, that he was extremely happy that we had found the wreck. And the family was happy as well. They said it gave them such great closure and respect for what you know their father, grandfather, great-grandfather did in the battle, because you could just see the damage and the horror that the ship went through. And that, I think, touched a lot of people, because that was the best thing about finding the Johnston and the Sammy B, was it gave us this incredible opportunity to retell the story of that battle and what these incredibly brave young men, many in their 18, 19 years old, did in this battle. And so many younger people have no idea at all about what these people did in World War II. And, and then they get interested and we get to tell the story. And I'll add to that, that uh, immediately after we found the wreck in March of 2021, uh, took the imagery and sent it to Jim Hornfisher who had written the book, the seminal book, Last Stand of the Ten Can Sailors, uh, which is, you know, must read for every destroyer enthusiast. 
And uh, Jim was um, in the terminal stages of brain cancer uh, at that point, but uh, he got to see the images of Johnston before he passed. And his son said how important that was to him. And even though he wasn't crew, he's part of this history. Yeah, if, any, if anyone isn't aware, uh, there's an incredible book called um, The Last Stand of the Tin Can. Say it was like Park said, James Hornfisher, who passed away, I want to say three years ago. It was in 2021. Okay. All right. So, so two years. I mean, not long. Fantastic author. It's a fantastic book. If you get the chance to check it out, if you find this type of thing fascinating, it's definitely, as, as Parks mentioned, a must read. Uh, it, it, it's a great book. So, so definitely check it out. Um, Victor. So before we let you go and talk behind your back, what <laughs> is, means. yeah, oh, we will. What, so what is next for you? Uh, you know, you said it takes two, three, four years for your next submersible design to come along. I can't imagine someone like you is sitting on your hands right now. No, that, that's not going to happen. Well, it took four years to design and build the limiting factor. And then we dove it intensively through COVID for four years. So that was an eight year mission that was incredibly intense. I do have a day job. I'm a private investor in industrial private equity. I also do venture capital. So I'm kind of focusing on that. I just started my own investment office in the last six months. So, you know, going back to make some money so I can fund all these different hobbies. And one of those is involving, you know, really high end venture capital. I'm now CEO of a biotechnology company. We're trying to cure some incurable diseases using artificial viruses. I'm also an investor and on the board of advisors of Colossal Biosciences. We are trying to de-extinct species that have passed away from the earth. And we're hoping to birth our first animal next year, which is probably going to break the internet when we announce that. And so I'm doing a lot of technology things. And in the background, I am indeed wrestling with all the trade-offs involved in submersible design to try and make it more affordable, but also more capable, just as safe and all those other things. But, you know, I still fly a great deal. I'm pursuing some technology initiatives in aviation. So yeah, I'm keeping busy. Did, did and, assuming, oh, oh, by the way, oh, yeah. of, of most interest to this group and the extended group that would be watching this is I am in the background, along with parks and others, I am doing long range planning. OK, if I am able to build another submersible and get back out in the ocean, what is my top 10 list for wrecks that we would go after? I mm -hmm. absolutely want to find the hole in the Gambier Bay. And then there are several other wrecks, maybe the Shinano and some others that have not been discovered that we still want to find. The, you know, the here you and the sort you, I don't think have been found uh, either. So there's a lot of wrecks that are on my list and it'd be great to be able to do a lot of the legwork beforehand because you don't want to waste a lot of time, you know, when you're actually on the site. Yeah, I'm, I'm rooting for Victor on these plans and hope he keeps me around because uh, I'm working with other historians to develop potential search plans for a long list of wrecks in the Pacific. Um, we're concentrating on the Pacific right now. Um, and there are a lot of wrecks that have yet to be found. So hopefully by the time he's got a submersible ready to go, we will have a game plan for finding some of these elusive wrecks. And there's a couple of Fletchers in that list. How did you guys meet? <laughs> <laughs> That's a great story. <laughs> um, you, you tell it, Park. Well, overall, um, uh, I, I, uh, in my Titanic dives, I uh, knew a, a guy named Rob McCallum, who organizes charters of various explorations, uh, and and I, I worked with him on Titanic. Uh, when Victor decided, and this is the thing that always blew my mind. Originally, Titanic was meant to be kind of a test dive for limiting factor because it was considered a shallow wreck. For someone who's always thought of Titanic as being really deep, uh, to, to Victor and his team, it was a relatively shallow wreck. And so I guess Victor uh, was looking for a guide to Titanic and he, he contacted Rob and Rob uh, put my name in front of him. Uh, what we were laughing about was that uh, our first meeting was interesting. Um, uh, Victor, I lived in San Diego at the time, and Victor said, well, we'll get it together one time. I, I sometimes come out to L.A., we'd go to dinner and get to know each other. 
And then I happened to mention that um, I was going out to Chicago. My wife had uh, worked for a couple of years out in Chicago and she got tired of that. And so I was moving her back to, uh, L to the LA area and decided that we would take Route 66 in, from Chicago to LA, do the entire Route 66, which I've always wanted to do. And Victor said, you know, I'm in Dallas. If you, you know, up around the Oklahoma City area, you find me an airfield and I'll meet you as you're passing through that area. And that's exactly what happened in the, in the middle of nowhere, just uh, west of Oklahoma City. There was this uh, little used airstrip, no control tower, anything, about three hangars there. Um, one of which had a couple of World War II warbirds in. So it was obviously a, a, an enthusiast type of airfield. Uh, the day that Victor came out, there was nobody at the airfield. Um, but I, we came out, uh, met Victor, who flew his helicopter in, landed it in the field. And then we went to a Denny's in somewhere in the middle of rural Oklahoma and planned a Titanic expedition. And then I took him back to his helicopter. He flew away. And then we continued on Route 66. So, How long ago was that? <laughs> that was oh, that was 2017. 2017, I believe. Yeah. Oh wow. Okay. 2017 or 2018, because um, we would go out the first time in October of 2018. Yeah. So, oh, it was 2017 because that's the year I brought Tamara home. So yes, it was 2017. Mm -hmm. yep. hmm. um, before we let Victor go, guys, John, Shane, Connor, what questions do you have for this guy? Um, I do have one, if my mic's working all right. Your mic is fine. Go all ahead. Right. Um, I noticed that in all the photographs of Johnston, it's always photos of the bow or just behind the bridge midship with the torpedo tubes. Is the stern gone from the wreck? Yeah, is pretty much. That's where most of the debris is that Robert Kraft and his team found. We believe that a lot of that was just blown out. I mean, you see a lot of the engine room components. Okay, the aft yeah, because were, were, were up above. So we okay. only the Johnston. We we found the front two thirds of the ship. All right. Well, yeah, I was just kind of curious because I had noticed that I was just on the Sullivan's less than a month ago, and it was just interesting, just realizing, oh. There's no pictures of the stir. So I guess, yeah, that answers my question. Yeah. So the, what I've kind of deduced is that um, in the first salvo um, that that hit Johnston, uh, three 18-inch shells from Yamato hit her amidships along the port side. And um, the, the, those, those hits deeply wounded Johnston at the time. But I believe that uh, they they basically started in motion a series of failures that when Johnston sank and hit toward the bottom, she actually broke in half mm. where Yamato's shells had hit her. Um, two of the shells of the three of the three shell salvo were in the stern section. Uh, the only one visible on the forward two thirds of the wreck that we found. Uh, went into the deck house there and exploded down in the, uh, the, the boiler room. Um, and um, you can just see where uh, on the wreck, on, on what's remaining, you can see the strakes on the port side bent outward. So when she broke in half, she broke port like this mm -hmm. and, then, and then it tore loose. And at some point after that, I speculate based on the damage of various debris found in the debris field that possibly two of her depth charges went off. One back in the storage racks on the uh, stern, which appears to have just literally shoved the emergency steering room out the bottom of the uh, vessel. And then the other one was on the starboard side in one of the K-gun racks. Uh, okay. So the reason why the stern is so it's, it's just in pieces. It's just little twisted burned pieces. I think are, are because of, of, of uh, deep uh, uh, inadvertent detonation of the depth charges. And this is, this kind of goes along with what Victor was talking about earlier about how you got to be careful around these wrecks. Um, we've seen depth charges unexploded is is one famously imaged by Robert Ballard uh, in the vicinity of the Yorktown wreck 
And then when we got to Sammy B, there's at least two intact Mark VI depth charges still in our K-gun racks. Mm -hmm. um, so they don't always explode, but then they do explode. So you never, you never can predict. I, I don't think we can understand. I've, I've, I've read the manual. I've looked to see how the Mark VI depth charge explodes. There are physical limitations preventing the trigger from setting off the de detonation, but somehow something evidently did blow Johnston Stern to pieces. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, thank you very much. She was, you know, we know that she was intact during the battle, right? Because Evans was standing there, as you say, barking orders down the hatch to the after steering compartment. So there, it's stable and secure, like while the battle's going on. Yep. Yeah, so, so, something happened though. If you look at the debris field on the sonar, and we did, it is a widespread area. So something happened above the debris field that caused a pretty cataclysmic event where you spread some really heavy wreckage over a pretty wide area, but the front two thirds of the ship remained completely intact, hit slope and slid down. So I don't know what happened, but something did. And, and it's interesting. If it, breaks, if it breaks off, you have that, if it, it breaks in half, now you're having all that pressure building through the stern as it's going down, creating well, bubbles. It wasn't quite, it wasn't quite ha uh, we keep saying it broke in half. It didn't break in half, it broke in it. The back third okay. broke off. So two thirds of the ship were still intact. So there was a much smaller piece. So maybe it was like the Titanic stern where the back third got separated and then it was just spinning, throwing debris randomly like the back of the Titanic did. Mm. Yeah, it's interesting that the debris field is in a... Um, it's an oval. Is in a, yeah, well, it's an oval, but it's oriented toward the southeast. And then the, um, the the main body, the Johnston, slid in in uh, basically a northern, slightly northwestern direction. So the dire direction of the debris field and the direction of the main body of the wreck are crisscrossing. They're they're different. It's very interesting. So they did separate in the water column after after she sank. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. I mean, that, I mean, that's pretty much. It's almost like you know, four fifths of the ship was intact. In just the back, you see that piece at the bottom, uh, kind of bottom right that's jutting out at 90 degrees. That piece yeah. scared the crap out of me because we were going along the side of the ship to get, you know, close and get good pictures. And I couldn't really see out that side. So I came damn close to running into it. And that's the big risk that you face of potential entanglement. If that had been a cable, that would have been a really, really bad day. But at the very last minute, I kind of caught it in terms of uh, seeing it on a camera and I did an evasive maneuver and, and got away. And that's a strike. That stone area was dangerous. That's a strike that's been peeled off the hull. So that's, that gives me the indication of the direction of which, uh, of, of where the stern went when they separated. Yeah. It hung on to the port side a little longer before it separated entirely. And there's no damage to the, the aft end of the forward section that matches the damage that we see on the stern debris field. So the stern exploded when it was separated from the bow. And we're talking about 6,000 meters of depth. Um, we did have two survivors in the water who felt the uh, two distinct explosions, uh, evidently from the depth charges. Now, I, I've looked at studies that were done during uh, immediately after World War II when they looked at uh, incidences where ships had gone under and depth charges that had not been safe had detonated at various depths. And if you were in the water when a depth charge went off, even within a few hundred feet of it, it could be fatal. And in fact, more than one Johnston survivor went into the water scared to death that one of those depth charges was going to go off and give, uh, in the words of Lieutenant Robert Hagan, the worst enema of your life as that pressure wave pushes water up forcefully through every orifice in your body. Um, but these two explosions that were felt by various, uh, more than one eyewitness described them, they were distant and at worst, they felt a rumble in their belly and, and that was it. So that indicated that they were thousands of feet or, feet or meters away from them in the water. So that's about the only timeline I can, you know, I can put on when the stern exploded. 
uh, that and the dispersal of debris on the ocean floor is another indication. I think that the stern exploded around 4,000 meters depth. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Any, uh, any other questions you guys have for Victor? Uh, I have one, but if Shane, if you have a question, you have a, um, Sammy B has any, uh, Johnson's great at all, but Sammy B. <laughs> this is a Fletcher anniversary show. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, the, Sl the Slater crew and the Sammy B crew probably trained together during shakedown. Mm -hmm. Um, the damage on the stern of the Sammy B, have you determined possibly what that was? Oh, I'm convinced just by looking at it that it got nailed by a big battleship shell. And it so? just, yeah, what's what's amazing about the Sammy B is that he held together. You know, I mean, it was cracked, but it was still barely connected. And she went all the way down the water column, the 6,800 meters. And then she, she impacted the side of a slope, which also made her hard to find. But the stern was right there. Unlike the Johnston, it didn't separate and disintegrate. The Sammy B was more or less together. Touch yeah, we, don't, we didn't see the explosive effects of a depth charge going off on Sammy B like we did on uh, Johnston. Um, according to our track charts, uh, it, it verified the, the common perception that Congo, battleship Congo, hit Sammy B with her 14-inch shells and tore her port side wide open. Yeah, but you can actually see that she she bow planed in the water because when you the first thing we saw was the front part of the ship and you could see where it had crumpled from the impact hitting the side of the slope. And she imploded. Uh, Sammy B took no damage forward of the bridge during the battle. And so she obviously maintained her watertight integrity as she sank to the point where her forward compartments all imploded. And it's, it's very, it was very interesting for me because it showed me what an imploded ship looked like. And when I apply that back to an analysis of Titanic, I, can, I find no implosive effects on Titanic, despite what some people have claimed. Hmm. It's amazing that I think it's the pilot house, the, the watertight door is still dogged out. Like they, didn't, they didn't leave it open. It, it shut. Yeah, but that was not, um, as you can see, the pilot house is in pristine shape. Yeah. Um, it, it flooded and equalized early, so it was not entirely watertight up in that area. Um, yes, there was a watertight, there is a watertight tour dog, but water came in somewhere else and equalized it. But in her bow, it evidently didn't get in anywhere uh, until she reached kind of a crush depth and then, then lost her watertight integrity up there then. So no, there's no still dog down compartments in Sammy B where some poor survivor is still living on the last gasp of air. None of that. Um, those compartments eventually gave in and, and, and crumpled. Well, unfortunately, I don't have, I didn't think to include any pictures of the Samuel B. Roberts, but uh, Parks, what do you think of the uh, chance that we could get this Victor guy back on with us to talk about the Samuel B. Roberts? Well, ask him. <laughs> I'd be happy to. Yeah? Yeah. It, it would be great because, I mean, if you're not aware, John uh, is the curator of the USS Slater in Albany. So he's got a special connection to uh, Destroyer Escorts. And we'd love to have you back on to talk about, well, I mean, the search for the Samuel B. Roberts, what it was like to find the torpedo tubes, you know, all that kind of stuff. That was even oh, harder I... because no one had found that wreck before. So that was a fresh find. We mm -hmm. had no guidance and... Uh, that was a different search, but we got it. Yeah. What were you going to say, John? Uh, the, the torpedo tubes. Just that picture of them sticking out of the sand. Is yeah, that was the first major piece of debris that I didn't find it, actually. It was the, the second pilot for the sub, uh, Tim McDonald, an Australian. So he found it, and it was very exciting on the ship when they requested to stay down a little bit longer when they found the torpedo racks. And then when they came up, they said, yeah, it was a triple torpedo rack. Then we knew it had to be the Sammy B because it was the only triple rack in the whole fleet. Uh, that fall that day. So th then it was. Then the pressure was on me. I was the pilot the next day. Now I got to go find the main wreck. That was. A, it was very very exciting. Well then, yeah, we'll definitely have you on. It's been a thrill to have you on here tonight. Well, thanks um, for the invitation. Yeah, and uh, uh, before before I let you go, um, your favorite war movie? That's a real tough one. Probably Dust Boot. Mm. Oh, okay. All right. 
It'll yeah, be a good one. Especially, come on, submarine. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, like I said, it's been a thrill having you on here, Victor Vescovo, out of Dallas, Texas, discoverer of the USS Johnston. Uh, thanks for joining us tonight. And like I said before, we're gonna boot you off and uh, talk behind your back. Sounds good to me. Thank All you so right. much. Thank Victor. you, gentlemen. Thank you. Take care. Thanks, yeah. Victor. Thank you. you have a good night, Victor. Okay, so there were 18 other Fletchers that were lost. Hold on a second. I can't believe I can't believe I was just talking to Victor Vescovo. <laughs> I, uh, he's, he's one of the most down to earth, famous people you will ever meet. Um, I just it's it's just like I said, he's a fellow geek. He's like any of us, but he has money. It's a big difference. Mark, um, speaking about fellow geek, let let the viewers know about the absolute geekiness of you and Victor down in the sub and your sci-fi sci-fi uh, connection. Oh yeah, uh, yeah. To show what a geek that 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 Victor is, um, I don't know how many of you have heard of the Five Hundred First Legion. Mm -hmm. Is the official Star Wars costuming uh, club? Um, I, no, I've, I I've never heard of that. Oh yeah, really? Well, look, look it up. Yeah. Five Hundred First Legion. Okay. Anyway, um, I was a, um, I was, I was a part of the Five Hundred First. Yeah, I had my ATAT -AT driver outfit, my Imperial officer outfit, all that good stuff. Um, before the dive on Titanic in twenty nineteen. Actually, no, I take it back. It was during the, um, the, that desert meeting uh, where, where Victor and I planned the Titanic expedition. Somehow I mentioned it. I don't know why. And Victor goes, oh, yeah, I'm a Mandalorian. Yep. And, whoa. And so uh, in 2019, two 501st Legion members dived to the wreck of Titanic. And the 501st Legion didn't care one bit. They, they, it's because you weren't in costume. Yeah, I took their challenge coin down, and, you know, imaged it at the Titanic wreck, sent it to them. They couldn't care less. What? And so uh, that's a little bit of a buzzkill when you're a geek. Yeah, no kidding. When your uh, organization just ignores you like that. And uh, I, I've let my 501st Legion um, uh, membership lapse. But that's also because, as all of you guys know, a freaking museum ship consumes your life <laughs> yep. well so, then if you would have found a, di a star destroyer buried in the sand on tatooine it would have been a different story that didn't happen jakku jakku jakku, jakku. i have no idea we get to talking about <laughs> <laughs> you know how do you know there's not a star destroyer somewhere on tatooine that's a big planet mm -hmm. we only saw a small part of it in the movies it would be a ricotta ship okay yeah, anyway. yeah I probably would. He's right. Okay. Okay. So I cannot hold a candle in Star Wars geekdom to my colleague Tim Nesmith here. Oh yeah. So okay. I'm a I'm a films guy. He's mm -hmm. an expanded universe and everything involved with nice. uh, uh, Star Wars kind of guy. So yeah. Well, uh, speaking of Tim, um, did you want to try and tackle the? Uh, destroyers that were lost because I'm already looking at the clock. It's 20 after nine on the Eastern time. Um, what do you guys think? Do you? Or do you want to schedule it for another time? Shane? I don't know what that means. Like to cover the other, the ninth, the other 18 that were lost, like to go into detail about how they were lost. <laughs> yes. We could, what? We, we, uh, like, we could I, cover. I, yeah. I mean, we don't have to cover them in detail, but we could talk about them overall. Yeah, yeah. that would be good. I mean, I don't have, uh, I think Tim has those stats, right? Yeah. Yeah, I've got some of them. Okay. <laughs> yeah, let, let, let's, let's, uh, let's do it real quick. And I'll try and, I'll try and keep up with you. Actually, you know what? Here, here's what I'll do. Um, That's Halligan. Wow. What happened to her? Hang on. <laughs> I don't have this all memorized in my head like Tim. No, no, that's right. I don't. I don't expect you to have it all memorized. But yeah. you know, the reason I say this, and I know it's we're already running way past time, but the photos that you sent me are amazing, and yeah. I I, I want to make sure that I they get shared. Sure. 
Well, here, let so me back this up. This is oh, Halligan. Yeah. yeah, go and ahead. And Halligan was on night patrol duty. And uh, at some point, she was engulfed in this huge explosion, sent debris over 200 feet in the air and clouded her from view. And witnesses on nearby vessels, when they saw her emerge, she was still underway, but she was missing everything forward of her number one smokestack. The bridge was gone. Likely she oh. struck a mine. Um, she started settling forward. They evacuated her in about an hour. And when all the rescue ships left with the crew, and there's, I think there's a photo showing them a little bit later, they were thinking she was gone. But the following morning, she, wa they, she was spotted washed up on shore on a reef about 50 feet away from shore. And she drifted 12 miles from the site of the explosion. She'd been beaten up by the waves, the surf, and hit at least twice by a Japanese shore battery. An inspection team evaluated her. Only about 15% of the equipment was salvageable. And there she remained uh, until after the war. And then uh, she was donated to the government of the Ryukyu Islands for scrap. Is this picture also the Halligan here? That's the Halligan, yes. Okay, all right. I want to make sure. Because the, the photos that you sent me, like I said, they're amazing. But they weren't in any particular order. So I want to make sure we're talking about the right... Um, yeah, and and I think the the one message that we'd like to cover here today when we talk about the lost Fletchers is how tough these ships were. Uh, some of I mean, yes, nineteen were lost. We've got some even more amazing pictures of torn up Fletchers that were not lost that um, that made it back. Um, out of the nineteen Fletchers, I was asking Tim the number before we signed on. How many were lost to kamikaze attacks? A good half of them, 10 out of 19, were lost to kamikaze attacks, which highlights one of the Fletcher's biggest threats, especially toward the end of the war. When you talk about the Okinawa campaign and um, uh, the preparations for the invasion of Japan, um, Kid took a you know kamikaze and uh, uh, she made it back into port and was fixed up and she still survives today. Um, Spence was lost in a typhoon along with the hull and the Monaghan. Um, but as, 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 as Tim picks some of these examples up, I just want to point out, um, what it takes to take out a Fletcher. It takes a lot. Mm -hmm. And a perfect example of that is the Bush and the Colahan talking about kamikazes on April 6th. Uh, Bush gets into trouble, has has aircraft coming in at her, and takes a hit. Ultimately, she ended up taking uh, three hits by aircraft and bombs. And Bush is coming in to help her, and Bush ends up, she shot down five kamikaze aircraft, but ended up taking four kamikaze slash bomb strikes uh, before both of them ended up sinking. Uh, Cass and Young, uh, Buzz isn't here tonight, but Cass and Young ended up having to uh, sink the Colhoun by gunfire. She still wasn't going under, but she was a loss, and they needed to get, get her out of the way before the Japanese could get out there and take her. So, I mean, that's a total for two ships of nine hits from a plane or a bomb. That's just insane. Um, Lego history, Sam was. I know he keeps on talking yeah. about the William D. Porter. He's yeah, like, oh, you got her pictures. Time. There you go. Are you going to cover that now? Yeah, yeah. Uh, William okay. D. Porter. Uh, Thank you, Sam. There I'm just going to. I'm just going <laughs> to briefly mention why she's the unluckiest ship in the in the United States Navy. Uh, she just had bad luck her whole run. Uh, she was escorting Roosevelt, FDR, and the Iowa across the Atlantic with, with the task force. Um, and just due to just sheer dumb luck and bad communication, she dropped depth charges in front of some of the capital ships, live depth charges. She um fired across somebody's bow if i remember correctly oh, uh, she ends up firing live torpedoes toward the iowa and they're under radio silence and they finally had to break radio silence out in the middle of the atlantic u-boat territory and say live fish headed your way and iowa turns away and and avoids it but at the same time that's happening iowa's turrets imagine these big 16 inch turrets all the five-inch turns, 40s, everything turning on this little bitty small boy because 
the president's on board. Is there a fifth column on this ship? What's going on? And they had ordered her to detach from the task force, go down. I think it was to Bermuda and was. basically had Mark Harmon slamming his hand on the, on the desk going, what are you doing? Um, and pretty much discovered they just had bad communication with each other. Um, she ends up in the Pacific. She gets to Okinawa. These pictures you see here and bad luck strikes one more time. Uh, she had, uh, a time. Uh oh. Uh oh. Parks, did you pay the internet bill this month? Yeah, Parks. Well, let me tell you about the Wi Fi challenges we have at the museum. Um, we, uh, on, we are on the outboard side of the railroad tracks, which isolates us from downtown Baton Rouge, and that includes um, Wi Fi connection. Uh, it has not been upgraded in many years because they won't run lines underneath the railroad tracks. So we're stuck with, uh, uh, I think it's 50 gigabyte speed. I think is the best. And then you have what Tim's frozen here now. All right. Well then here, so, we're going to pull, we're going to pull Shane up to bat. Okay. Go ahead. Because I know he knows a little bit about this one. Uh Oh, you're putting me on this. Oh, the Abner Reed. Right. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so, yeah. There's the two wicked wrecks of the Abner Reed, one in the Aleutians. And then I can't remember where she was actually sunk. But I think that prior picture, uh, where the, the the bow is straight up and down, is that the Abner Reed, if I remember right? Uh, go the one, pro yeah, that one. Is that Abner Reed, or was that identified as? Uh, I do not see. I do not see an identifier. It could be. Yeah, that was taken from an aircraft carrier, but I just can't remember the ship. I've, I've oh, seen okay. that picture plenty of times. Um, yeah, so she was uh, in the Aleutians. Um, and her stern was blown off, uh, from a mine. And again, as Parks had said, uh, you know, they're pretty, I think it was Parks or Tim, she was pretty, the, you know, Fletcher's were pretty sturdy for what damage they could take. And of course these guys were DC drilling all the time. Uh, you know, especially talking about Johnston and, you know, uh, general quarters, Johnny GQ, Johnny, uh, they were drilling all the time. And then, uh, so that she was repaired uh, put into the Pacific and uh, then eventually was sunk. Uh, I just don't have that information with me right now. Yeah, she sank off uh, uh, Kiska in Alaska. Oh, yeah, that's and that's where she was discovered uh, by um, by Noah in 2018. Oh, mm -hmm. Tim's back. Oh, yeah, yeah. Like, oh, history, Sam. I'm talking about a bad luck ship, and I got booted from the internet. So <laughs> well, that's all right. No, we uh, we moved on to the Abner Reed, and uh, Shane um, on the uh, Buffalo Naval Park, I know, did at least one, possibly two videos on the Abner Reed, and so we had we had Shane come up to bat for you. Um, Ooh, excellent. Yeah, excellent. Let's see here. Did you finish Porter? Well, yeah, kind of. But then Shane okay. had an interesting question. So this yeah. picture here the bow that's sticking straight up right what what which uh which ship is that that's porter that's porter okay oh. that's porter the wreckage of the plane drifted under her and then the bomb detonated lifted her up and broke her back yeah. oh. wow and ironically not a single crew member lost every mm -hmm. crew member got off yeah, yeah. <laughs> all right then here so she let's... had bad luck but she could have had worse luck she could have had worse luck she saved all her good luck for the end and by the way, notice the sonar dome. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Look at that. That uh, I'm glad you pointed it out because I didn't. Uh, I didn't make the connection, but yeah, you can see it clearly right there. Yeah. Um, we got to make sure right. we don't damage ours as we get out of the cradle. Uh. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Tim, what is yeah. which? Which Fletcher is this? That's Halligan. That's Halligan. Okay. That's Halligan again. All right. Let me, okay, we did the Abner Reed, and then you had some several, well, let's see, it looks like maybe 10 photos of some underwater wreckage, and let me pull that up here, so we're looking for number 12, all right, here we go. That, I believe, is the strong, and Tammy Johnson is in the audience, I believe, unless she's left. Uh, and she is 
with the Strong Association. I believe her dad was on board. Um, Strong was hit and sunk by the longest torpedo shot in known torpedo shot in history, 11 nautical miles from the parks, correct me if I'm mangling it, Nizuki. N-I-I. Z-U-K-I. Um, yeah. She was going uh, into Engane and she took the hit. Uh, it uh, tore her up something fierce. Chevalier was right beside her, rammed her at an angle so that they could get the crew off and throw the nets over so the crew could get over safely. Um, and then I believe Petrol is the one. Yeah, Petrol found her in 2019 uh with the wreckage and uh there is we talked about the depth charges and the concussion doing damage she got torn up quite a bit uh by the depth charges lieutenant hugh Mel hugh bar miller made it to shore and he was bleeding from every orifice uh he told his shipmates leave him for dead and nobody ever saw those four or five guys again if i understand the story correctly hugh actually lived and being an officer of the United States Navy, took the battle to the Japanese on the island in a guerrilla war for 37, 38 days, something like that. 39 days. Um, there's a book called The Castaways War that talks about him, and they're actually talking about making it for a movie. Hmm. But, uh, yeah, that's that's the strong. Is this also of the strong? No, this is different. That's the De Haven. That was the very first uh, Fletcher sunk. Um, and it, it, almost looks, found her. it almost looks like the kid at night. <laughs> <laughs> We're not that corroded on the bottom. <laughs> yeah, but you can, the, the struts are clearly visible there. Yeah, the shaft. Yeah. I mean, no, yeah. Um, yeah I, th another word about the depth charges. Um, you know, these Fletchers were anti -sub primarily anti submarine vessels, even though as, uh, as, as destroyers developed into World War II, destroyers like Fletchers were multi capable. Uh, anti-air, anti-sub, and even anti-surface to a certain extent. But be being primarily an anti-submarine vessel, they carried a number of depth charges aboard. And the crew was very well aware, after a few early examples uh, during the war, of the danger that those depth charges uh, posed to the, their own crew if the ship went under. Uh, during the, you know, reading through the eyewitness testimony board Johnston, there's more than one crewman that um, remarked on uh, that they, they were in, either in a damage control team or they just were paying attention at the time that uh, great attention was made to safe all of the depth charges on board as they knew Johnston probably was going to be going under. And it was one of their priorities um, to, to make sure that those depth charges were safe so that they wouldn't get blown up by their own depth charges in the water. For Johnston, they were um, they they jettisoned all of the depth charges in the racks, and this is while Johnston's being pounded on by other surface ships. There's guys back there on the fantail releasing the depth charges, and one of the depth charge racks got stuck, and they had to have a few men work on on uh, freeing up that depth charge so the rest of the track could be cleared. But they could do they couldn't do anything with the um, depth charges in the storage racks on the fantail or in the K guns. Uh, I don't have any indication that the, that if, if there were depth charges actually loaded into the K gun that they were fired, my suspicion is that there were none. Well, no, I take that back. If uh, general course, she would have had them. So I, I, I don't know the condition of the K gun ones, but um, like I said, on Samuel B. Roberts, we would see, um, we would see depth charges still stuck in those K gun racks. Mm -hmm. So I just wanted to bring that up about depth charges. That was a that was a one of the Fletcher's uh, most potent offensive weapons, but it also was the most dangerous weapon when the ship started to go down. Well, and and talking about that, wasn't it um, wasn't the guy's uh, name that gave the testimony for that? Wasn't his last name Hagen? Well, um, Lieutenant Robert Hagen was the ship's gunnery officer, and he was also the senior surviving officer. So he wrote the after action report for Johnston. Okay. Um, he, he was up in the gun director as the gunnery officer. He was in the, in the Mark 37 gun director that sits on top of the pilot house. And that gun director 
directs the fire of the five five inch guns on the Fletcher, either in all guns mode or in local control. Uh, so he obviously could not see everything <clears throat> going on the ship. Uh, I imagine his discussion about the depth charges, even though the, as a gunnery officer, they were under his purview, he evidently interviewed other survivors of Johnston in order to bring it together in the after action report. And then, um, Tim, didn't you say that one of the ships that went down, one of the Fletchers that went down, wasn't it called the Hagen? No, D Haven, D E, and then uh, my apologies. Okay, all right, I, I misheard. It sounds you. similar when you say it fast. Yeah. Um, all Especially right. With that Minnesota accent. I don't have a Minnesota. <laughs> no, you might uh, you might have heard me talk about Hagen. Uh, Robert Hagen's son, Rob Hagen, is a good friend of mine here in Baton Rouge, as it would turn out. Oh yeah. And, uh, and for those of you who know Louisiana culture, he's going to be the king of Spanish Town uh, this coming year. Oh, wow. So, you know, the king, I know the king. <laughs> All right. Uh, here, let's, let's pull up this question or this, uh, this photo here. Um, would this I, also be the strong? Uh, yeah, I believe that's the strong. And actually I owe an apology to everybody because the very colorful, uh, wreckage photos that were earlier, I misidentified that as strong. That was actually the part of the, uh, the uh, stern wreckage, yeah, that. That's actually part of the stern wreckage of the Admiral Reed up in Alaska where she had her stern blown off. Oh, okay. Okay. And that was the uh, uh, that was the RV Petrel, right? No, that was Noah. Uh, that was Noah. Noah? Noah, right. yeah. So you're talking about these photos here. All yes. Right. And you could just tell uh, the depth. You could just tell the depth because of, as they were mentioning Victor and uh, Parks earlier, you could see the marine growth and the marine life because that, I don't believe, was too deep of a wreck. No, you know what, Shane? That's a really good point. I mean, when you talk about discovering wrecks and you've got the Titanic, you've or, or here, if this is the Admiral Reed, I mean, yeah. it's just everywhere. Um, and that's really, really cold water. It's shallow water. And yet it's still just, whoops. you know, this, that. well, yeah. the, the other one you had, the De Haven there. Oh yeah, yeah. Hold on Haven is in the South Pacific. It's at Guadalcanal, but it doesn't have near the growth that you had with the the stern in Alaska. There's a lot of factors that go into marine growth and how it affects a wreck. Uh, it's not just depth or lack of op oxygen. Uh, like I mentioned with Titanic, uh, she's at the like the exhaust port of the Gulf Stream, the warm waters of the Gulf Stream. So she's getting all kinds of uh, detritus coming out of the Gulf Stream and a lot of life forms that get deposited over the Titanic wreck. And that's contributed to the growth of life at that wreck site. Uh, you had asked me earlier about the differences uh, between 2005, the first time I dived on Titanic, and then 2019. The biggest, the biggest difference I saw was not really the wreck itself, but the explosion of life that had happened between 2005, 2019, 2005. Yeah. It looked like this and you would see occasional thing like, and I'm not a biologist. That's a little, that's a little thing attached to the Ford railing there. Yeah. Some anemone or something. I don't know what you call it, mm -hmm. but you would see something like that in a, in a, in a, and a rat tail fish occasionally, and there's some crabs and uh, some, what we call brittle stars or like starfish, but their legs are really long. In 2019, everywhere you looked, there was there was life. There was either uh, a flowering kind of life, like the sea anemones, or fish, crabs. It just they were all over the place. It's just uh, it's belonging. Titanic is belonging more now to the underwater environment that's claimed her as her home than um, than it does to us anymore. And that's the way it's going to go. She's she's now Titanic is now her own ecosystem. Uh, the um, which one did you say that was? De Haven, the one, the very colorful one. Which one did you say that was? The very colorful one is uh, Abner Reed. The oh, Abner Reed one okay. right here is De Haven. So that Abner Reed wreck now is an entire ecosystem. Mm -hmm. That's their home. It's not ours anymore. It's theirs. Yeah, and that was found, I think, in roughly three hundred feet of water. So. Yeah, yeah, that's that's less well, than the length of a Fletcher class. <laughs> yeah. and, and this is why occasionally you'll see decommissioned ships sunk as artificial reefs. They'll they'll sink them in an uh, area of known biological activity 
And once they settle to the bottom, they might serve as a, uh, a commercial dive target. You know, people will, will pay money to go dive and explore the wreck. But over time, uh, the life down at that in that area will take it over and claim it as their own. And, and then it's their neighborhood. Let's see here. The next picture I want to pull up. That's strong. This is strong. Okay. That's strong. And Strong has really good clarity on their pictures. I was really blown away by that. That's yeah, a these... five-inch gun. Well, no, it, that's a five-inch gun. I thought it was. Um... Looks like a five-inch. No, gun. that's a five-inch gun. Yeah. No. What do you think it was? You know, at at first glance at this photo, it almost looked like a ship's telegraph. Oh no no no! It's it's bigger than that. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm glad you pointed that out because that's kind of what I thought it was. Um, let's see, like everything folded in on itself. And then uh, there was this photo here. Uh, when I first saw yeah. that picture uh, at Historic Naval Ships Conference. I started cursing because we had to, we worked so long to get a replica of one of those to put on kit. And I'm what like, I could have just dove down and grabbed that one. But What is it? It's the blast shield blast for the torpedo shield. tubes. The yeah, actual torpedo tubes. Uh, oh, just in front of the number three mount. And it protects the torpedo men from the concussion. Now, okay. right there, that's the pilot house of Strong, and shes it's just been oh, popped yeah. off of the deck underneath it. Yeah, I see. I can see the windows on the right. And she's a round, round bridge Fletcher. Yeah. Um, and you notice the the height above it. I'm pointing at the camera here. You notice the the height above it moving to the left. That's the base of the Mark 37 director. The director itself has been pulled off, and that shows you the difference between the square bridges yeah. and the round bridges. Because when they got to the square bridges, they cut six feet off of the height of that pedestal to drop the. The weight of the of the Mark 37 is down lower to give her a lower profile. That's um, a great picture. That, that is great, and I'm just amazed at how cleanly it popped off the deck. Yeah. So hold on a second here. So there. Okay. So comparing that to this guy. Yeah. Is that what you're yeah. referring to? That's yes. a square bridge. Okay. And there's. The I mean, take a look at the director. What Tim is talking about is the distance between the top of the bridge, the overhead of the bridge, and mm -hmm. the base and the mount of the gun director. You can see there it's it's much shorter. Yeah, but two feet or something I like that. And then take it. a look at that other picture, and you can see how long it is in that. Oh, that's fabulous. I'm yeah. five six. I would never hit my head on that director walking walking around it. But on kid, I have to crawl underneath it. Mm -hmm. Well, that. That's Let's fabulous. See. That was the last of the wreck photos. Um, <coughs> so I'm glad we had a chance to to cover those. Yeah. Um, um, all right. And one 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 more observation for for some of these that just you couldn't sink them. Chevalier broke. Uh, Chevalier broke in half. She had or she had her bow blown off, and then. Uh, it floated away, and uh, O'Bannon rammed into her uh, on the starboard side because the, the blunt front end of the hull dug into the water, and she kind of swerved over to the side, and then O'Bannon just T-boned her. Uh, that stayed afloat, and they had to torpedo one piece of it and then sink the other one with depth charges. She just would not die, even though she's bisected. Um but you get to another one, uh, and from the moment she took her first kamikaze to the moment she went under, 12 minutes, she's gone. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, they if they got enough of a beating, they'd go down fast, but some of them just would not die. They were that well put together. Mm -hmm. right. And it depended yeah. on what happened, too. Secondary explosions, you know, you yeah. blow a boiler um, things like that. Or if the kamikaze's bomb goes off or doesn't go off, is a lot of variables. There, a bomb went off. <laughs> yeah, that's Longshaw. She she took a hit to the forward magazine, blew the front of the ship off, and just secondary fires. She's just burning constantly all the way down the length of her. Is um, let's see here. Is that 
That's long saw as well. Wow. That's just amazing. And people <laughs> actually survived this. That's what's amazing to me about it. And Not only the blast just didn't want to die, but the people survived this craziness. Oh, oh, the, the, so the cylindrical thing in front of that gun mount uh, aft of the funnel is the blast shield you're talking about? That's yes. the blast shield, right. Okay. You got a, uh, you got a dead sailor top right. Yeah, trapped in the wreckage. Oh, I oh, like oh, oh. Yep. Yeah, yeah. And I like this. What do we got here? Uh, that, I believe, is Longshaw as well. Um, and it's taken from the Essex, and that's the Hornet in the background. Okay. Actually, no, I take it. Yeah, that is Longshaw. Yeah. Let's see if there's any others. Oh, wow. Okay, here, wait. Let's see if I can. Let's see. Number 21. Where is that? Um, so when you talk about air battles, um, I've seen this photo before. Yeah. I can't remember how, but, you know, all the anti-aircraft, yeah. you know, fire. I, I'm, I'm sure you probably don't know what Fletcher this was. That was. I don't remember which one it is, but yeah, uh, the, plume, the black plume is her uh, detonating. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Oh man, it's on the tip of my tongue. Oh yeah. Taint low. No, no, it's it's a destroyer. No, it's a destroyer. Is That's it Brownson? a destroyer blowing up? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, there are two explosions. This is the second one. Like fifteen minutes after the first one. Oh man. Is it Brownson? You think? Hang on. DD five eighteen. Maybe. Yep, that's Brownson. Okay. DD five eighteen. Yeah, so there were two explosions. A minor one. This is the one that actually, I, th I think if I remember right, sank her, obviously. Let's see here. Um, and we're not going to have a picture of this, but... The um, here's, the, here's the Brownson right there. That's 518. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So the, at the same time that uh, in the same battle where Johnston was uh, sunk, her sister ship, Hull, H-O-E-L, was also sunk. And um, when I read through her um, survivor testimony, I'm expecting that wreck to be especially ugly. Um, mm. She not only took um, took shells that took out her Mount 54, or Mount 55. Um, there's reason to believe that her entire number three mount was blown clear off the ship before she uh, went under. Yeah. Um, uh, Commander Copeland, Lieutenant Commander Copeland, the skipper of the Sammy B. Roberts, gave a very detailed uh, interview in the 1950s about the battle. And toward the end, he saw what he thinks is Johnston. But I've come to believe in, in uh, as I read through it over and over again, I think that um, Copeland saw both Hull and Johnston and conflated the two because the damage he described the Johnston as Johnston seems to correlate more with the whole more specific, most specifically, he said that the number three mount was completely gone. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We did find the number three mount with Johnston in the debris field along with the number, with the number four mount. So um, Copeland's description of the number three mount being gone on Johnston as she passed by doesn't really square. Also talks about the mass being bent, uh, and hanging down, but we know from Johnston, um, and even though, even though we found the mast of Johnston in the debris field bent like Copeland described, we also have a uh, word from Lieutenant Hagen in his after action report that the surface search radar uh, stayed, uh, stayed operable to the very end, which wouldn't happen if the mast were down like, uh, like Copeland described. So I'm expecting that when we do find Hole, that um, she's going to be a really messed up uh, wreck, even if she didn't have depth charge explosions like Johnston did. Uh, we're going to see the ferocity of the battle. And, and just as an aside, where I have her predicted, she's down in the trench. Uh, it's, very, it's, it's a very good possibility that either Hole or the Japanese cruiser Chikama, which also sank in the same area, could be ultimately the deepest shipwrecks on earth down at like 9,000 meters. Jeez. 
Wasn't there a, a destroyer, not the hull, not the Johnson, obviously, but wasn't there a destroyer that was was seen either escaping the battle or leaving the battle and then was never seen again? No, the other Fletcher that went in on the attack was a Herman. And um, that was it. she went in, got her licks in, took damage, uh, but main, maintained it. And then she um, resumed her station with the... Uh, with Taffy three as they were retreating. In fact, Johnston and Harriman almost collided um, yeah. while Johnston was rushing over to counter the destroyer threat that she, that she saw developing to the West. Uh, she ran across uh, Harriman. Uh, you know, and then there's smoke both from the battle and also generated by the smoke generators aboard the, uh, the ships to mass the fleet. Um, the, she came out of the smoke and almost, uh, those two almost collided, but Harriman didn't disappear forever. Uh, that crew came home. <laughs> okay, but, right. uh, uh, you're talking like it's a ghost ship or something. That Harriman. No, I, yeah. I I remember hearing a story. Maybe it wasn't a Fletcher, um, but there was a ship, and maybe it wasn't even Leyte Golf. I um, I should know better than to ask questions without you know the details. But I thought there was a, a story of a ship that um, you know during the battle in the fog of war, or whatever, just you know, but disappeared and someone had not, no one had seen it since. Yeah. Um, I'd never heard that one. Yeah. Right, it would I'm, be interesting to, uh, you know, I think Hagen says that they came within 10 feet of each other, the Hearman and the Johnston, you know, in that smoke and that, uh, when they were laying down the smoke, that would be interesting, uh, to, if that was ever validated within 10 feet of each other, it could be apocryphal, Great. right. But it, it, maybe 20 feet or 30 feet, but to come within 10 feet of each other, uh, is actually, a, yeah, actually one of my colleagues, uh, Rob Lundgren, uh, before COVID locked down the national archives, he came across a photo that he didn't understand at the time, but what he's come to believe since it was a picture taken from the carrier nearby, I believe is the Kitquin Bay that took a picture of that near collision of Johnston and Harriman. And there is one photo that I do have that probably is of the same series that just shows the Herman and Johnston would be out of frame at that point. I desperately want to find that photo. Mm. Um, it was mislabeled or it was misfiled, I should say. It wasn't in where he expected to find it. So um, one of these days, I hope to um, surface that photo. And, and, and not only will, can we verify the story, which, and it wasn't just Hagen who talked about it, the officer of the deck, uh, DeGuardio, DeGuardi, uh, he mentioned it as well. Um, they, they, you know, Johnston at that point was operating only on her forward engine. And so she was limping along at half speed. Um, they had to back full on her remaining shaft to avoid mm -hmm. the collision. But I'd like to see that picture, not only to validate mm -hmm. that, that story, but also I want to see Johnston's condition mm -hmm. just, you know, just before the end. Road mm -hmm. trip. Yeah. <laughs> We're going um, down to College Park. Yeah. Parks, Frank, one of the Frank, uh, one of the viewers wants to know where you got got your hat. Had it made. There's had plenty made. of custom ball cap places online. Um, He's wealthy know. enough to that he could have his own hats made. I, I don't know. I, I don't know anybody has these in stock, but uh, you know, I had it custom made, and then of course I had the depth that the wreck was found on the back. Oh wow! Oh, so, that is cool. Yeah, it's total. Oh, no, that is Johnston. Oh, okay. I used to wear this hat every day until I got another ship. Yeah. <laughs> uh, let's see here. Um, and one point, real quick, just to correct an error I made: the the last picture with the big black smoke trail going up was not Brownson. It was actually Abner Reed when she Oh, sank. that's why. That's why. Yeah. yeah. Jeez. So that's that's her taking the kamikaze uh, off the of late thing. That's why I was so familiar with that picture. Uh, you're talking about this guy. The big black plume. Well, that's Johnson. Uh, no, no. That, no, I know. That I know. Uh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's Abner Reed. Uh huh. It looks similar to a Brownson shot, but but it's Brownson has white smoke, not black smoke. Oh, okay. So wait, you're t then the picture you were thinking of was this guy? Yeah, that's Brownson. Okay. Oh, oh, okay. I can see that. Yeah. So one one 
odd loss of a Fletcher would be the uh, the Spence. Uh, anybody that knows the story of the K mutiny, well, I know where that sounds coming from. <laughs> Sorry. Um, anyway. <laughs> Anybody knows the story of the K mutiny? That was ba based off of um, off uh, off of a ship that was caught in um, a fictional ship. The uh, Kane uh, was mm -hmm. an amalgam of the ships that were got that got caught in Typhoon Cobra in 1944. And um, the Spence was there, there were three ships lost. Spence being one of them. She was a Fletcher. Uh, I forget the class of the Monahan in the hull, um, but. Um, yeah, that um, it 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 talks to the ferocity of a storm that a Fletcher class destroyer in full watertight condition uh, could be lost in a storm like that. These mm -hmm. ships, I, one thing we point out to visitors that come aboard the kid is that you know appreciate the steady deck mm -hmm. because these ships never had a steady deck; <laughs> they were always uh, rolling and heaving uh, mm -hmm. in in the ocean and. Um, uh, in fact, today when I was taking the guy around, he took specific interest in the clinometer that is in our uh, Thorswood ship passageway there that shows up to 90 degrees of uh, angle of heel. Mm -hmm. um, these ships could lay over on their side and still recover. Very well designed for that. Low centers of gravity. But um, whatever happened to Spence overwhelmed that watertight integrity and she was lost. Yeah. She took two 70 degree rolls. The second one she didn't come back from. Yeah. Uh, last picture I'm going to pull up here and then uh, we'll shut it down. Let's see. It's going to be. Admiral Reed. Sure. No, I believe that is the Brownson. It's that's a the shark. The <laughs> oh, that's the Brownson. That's the Brownson. Okay. Which was, um, let's see, this. He was at Cape Glau Gloucester, Gloucester. That's this destroyer right here, 518, correct? Correct. Okay, got it. All right. Well, let's see. We managed to kill two hours. Yeah, that's good. You know, I want to mention, certainly, you know, obviously some folks here would be very familiar with this. This is a wonderful article. You know, uh, Parks has talked about Lieutenant Hagen, the gunnery officer on board the Johnston. First off, it's astounding because it is in that, it's the uh, Saturday Evening Post with a really famous uh, Norman Rockwell painting on it, you know, with his girlfriend right here. I'm yeah. sure everyone's familiar with that. But in, oh, there it is, in this art, in this particular edition is the uh, firsthand account from Lieutenant Hagen. And uh, I just, this was sitting uh, in my office and I just grabbed it and I said, oh my God, it's the story of the Johnston, right? <laughs> I, I took it as a donation because of the cover itself. Uh, and it's a famous uh, cover. And then only after the fact come to find out that it's uh, Hagen's account of the Johnston, which is, so I would recommend that. It's the Saturday Evening Post, May 26, 1945. So kind of like the VE edition potentially. And uh, you know, what's interesting is that Tim and I were talking on the phone earlier today about your office and uh, <laughs> you know, about all the different uh, things that you take in. And then, you know what, Tim, here he comes with this amazing, you know, I know, I know. it's like, I, you I know, know, I can't pick on Shane cause he's got great, you know, but know. or yeah. So yeah, you were being talked about earlier and then uh, in a good way. Yeah, oh, oh, yeah. Of, course, of course, guys. Absolutely. No, yeah, doubt no your my office looked much like your office until recently. So oh, mm -hmm. very good. Yes. Yeah. And you so have to be Ken, conscious um, about it. You have to be conscious about it. Ken, I've and got actually the, go ahead. Well, go ahead, Parks. Can I have the PDF of that article? I can send oh, yeah. it to you and you can provide it to your listeners if you would like. Okay, That'd be fantastic. I'd, yeah, I'd love it. Um I didn't. I didn't know anything like that existed. I mean, obviously, I knew about the firsthand account, but I didn't know it had been published like that. So that would be great. I'd love to. I'd love to see that. Um, all right, let's uh, let's start winding this down, and we're going to start with the USS Kidd Veterans Museum. When it comes to, all right, Tim Nesmith, Superintendent, USS Kidd. 
What do you guys have going on right now? Because you do not shut down. You are year round. Dry dock prep, dry dock prep, dry dock prep. We're pulling blueprints off uh, and filling up my office. Um, and we're getting ready to get an offsite uh, storage and about to start pulling major stuff off the ship to get ready for leaving in the spring. Um, as far as events, uh, December 7th is our next big event. Um, and uh, we'll have a memorial service, uh, educational service on board the Fantail, weather permitting for Rear Admiral Kidd and the 46 Louisianians killed at Pearl Harbor. Um, and also there's a Coast Guard cutter, um, a little boy tender, the White Alder, USCGC White Alder that uh, ironically sank on December 7th in 1968, just downriver from Baton Rouge, uh, a Taiwanese freighter split her in half in the middle of the night. And she went down, hit the bottom of the Mississippi, and the river immediately started covering her over. So all but one or two of her crew ended up entombed in the White Alder in the same way that the crew of the Arizona was entombed. So the Coast Guard comes down every year, joins us, and has a ceremony right after this year. I think it's going to be right before our uh, Pearl Harbor ceremony. Oh, wow. Okay. So you, you guys have a lot going on. Um, let's see. Parks, uh, anything that you wanted to add about what's what's happening right now? Or is all your time consumed with dry, dry dock prep? <laughs> Um, all my time is consumed with trying to figure out what the hell I'm going to do. Uh, nobody's, we, 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 this ship hasn't moved in 40 years. It mm -hmm. hasn't had a dry dock since the Navy had it in 62. Um, taking, t taking this major attraction off of, um, you know, off of the downtown Baton Rouge riverfront uh, is just now starting to hit the people of Baton Rouge. Uh, we are going to plan extensive ceremonies. Today, I uh, met with one of uh, uh, the country's premier tiki mug artists to uh, uh, make a commemorative tiki mug of Kid that will be in two different editions. There'll be the edition when she goes away, and the glaze of the mug will be in her 1945 paint scheme, as you see here. And we are intending to um, sandblast and repaint the ship in dry dock and we'll have her return in her 1944 uh, Dazzle Camouflage and the second edition of the Tiki Mug that will be sold upon her return will be in that glaze of the Dazzle Camouflage. So so, so all the paint that uh, that Tim put on uh, a couple of months ago is going to be uh, blasted away. <laughs> yeah, and it, and it was always intended that way. Um, the paint that we painted it in uh, is not your typical marine grade paint. Uh, we wanted her to spend her last year or two in Baton Rouge looking as fresh as possible. Uh, fresher than this photo here indicates. Yeah. Um, but, but we didn't want to waste money unnecessarily. So, yes, Tim and his crew did a Herculean effort to paint the side of the ship um before the river uh, rose uh, or fell too too far for them to paint with and uh, that's why tim has been in physical therapy for the past <laughs> several weeks um but yeah just to make the ship look good but that that paint's not expected to last um because okay. we didn't we didn't use the top grade paint knowing so for those of you that want to learn more about the uss kid veterans museum check out their youtube channel simply search for uss kid veterans museum you can also find them on facebook i think that's where i saw a lot of tim's pictures of him painting the the hall was on on facebook so you can see a lot of good stuff there and if you want to support the uss kid check out their website uss kid with two d's uss kid.com connor thanks for pulling that up uh definitely check out their website and remember they're going to dry dock they need all the support they can get um Anything else you guys wanted to add? No. Yep. Thank you. All yeah, good. absolutely. All right. Then we're going to move on to Buffalo Naval Park. Shane Stevenson. Yeah. All you guys right. uh, you guys are going to be shutting the water off, what, I guess in about a month. Does that mean your season's uh, winding down? Yeah, we're going to shut it off right after, right before you arrive. So, uh, you know, <laughs> when I get you set up for the dirtiest jobs, 
uh, in an, <laughs> on a museum ship, right? Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, the water is probably going to be going off November 20th. Uh, and like this weekend, you know, I don't know if you guys celebrate this, but there's something called Halloween. I don't know if it's celebrated in other parts of the country, but uh, so we're having like a ship or treat. So we did it. This is the second year we knew it. Kids can come on board. There's different stations. They get to walk around, uh, listen to, uh, you know, some docents and staff talk about some history and things. Uh, and then we're doing, uh, I'm very happy with that. We are doing uh, the first of a Twilight Zone war episode marathon where we're going to show four Twilight Zone episodes uh, with war as the theme. Uh, so that will be Saturday, uh, tomorrow night. So I'll be working again until about 10 o'clock tomorrow night. And uh, then we're doing, like the kid has mentioned, uh, Pearl Harbor. We have a FDR reenactor uh, that has come, who came last year and he would like to come again this year. So we wheel him in with his cigarette holder and his wheelchair and then he he talks like he's FDR, which is pretty cool. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we'll Does be. Does he have a phallus? I'm sorry. Does he have a phallus? Oh. <laughs> yeah, like a little, uh, a, a little, um, yeah, a little stuffed animal, and then he just tosses it to the side. Okay, there we go, <laughs> you know. Uh So, yeah, and then, but I mean, you know, we're talking about. We had some volunteers today talking about the CIC. Uh, gun plot, you know, we did the stabilization of the spaces. So, of course, over the weekend, I'm sorry, over the winter, we'll be having a lot of individual projects going on. Uh, and then winterizing the Sullivans, which we have done. Uh, I guess some updates on that is that we've reached out and we've had meetings with the city, the mayor, the city of Buffalo, the county of Erie, uh, Senator Schumer's office, get Governor Hochul's office, uh, and our congressmen to all say we still need help before we can get to dry dock. We're about seven million dollars, six seven million dollars short. So uh, we're looking for support. We brought them all into one room together. We we told them uh, the story and what it's going to take to uh, get her to dry dock, and uh, hopefully we can keep that team together and working and, and pulling different funding streams from uh, different uh, local, state, federal uh, sources. And is there any kind of a date, target date, any kind well, of anything set that you want to try and make dry dock happen? Yeah, we're looking, uh, we're trying to shoot by ha having the money by October, this around this time next year. I see. All is right. The goal to have the seven, six, seven million dollars. Well, if anyone out there wants to throw their support behind the Buffalo Naval Parks effort to get the USS the Sullivans into dry dock, definitely check out their mm -hmm. website, buffalonavalpark.org. You can also find their content on YouTube. Search for Buffalo Naval Park. There you go. Thank you, Connor, for pulling that up. And uh, just as with the uh, kid, throw your support behind the effort to get the USS the Sullivans into dry dock badly needed repairs and you are coming up right ken come on well we traded text about that and uh i uh, i definitely want to done okay yeah good. are you so, gonna do a dirty jobs thing ken why the hell not um, hey i've got i've got a septic tank that needs to be cut out of the kid you want to do that <laughs> well we'll, I, we'll even pay for you to go do that <laughs> yeah <laughs> uh let's see anything else you wanted to add to the uh buffalo nope. naval park before we move on to the slater all good all right then uss slater in albany new york john f what's going on um a few things ken you're driving across new york to see the slater right <laughs> <laughs> is your water still gonna be on <laughs> uh we'll actually Probably be shutting it off right around the twentieth as well, because we have an overnight on the eighteenth. Oh, okay. So you you, you have an overnight right up until the end. Yep. Yeah. Got it. Keep and it in mind, Ken. We're open all winter and we're warmer down south. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Our water gonna... stays on until you cut out that septic tank. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Tim. Um, uh, Tim was telling me that you guys are year round. Uh, yeah, it's been a while since I was on. Uh, we had Hensa last last month. That was fun. Um, got to meet a lot of cool people, including a few folks here. 
learned a few things. Um, oh, geez, what's I was going? Oh, tomorrow, kind of too late, I guess. Tomorrow, 10 a.m., uh, we're celebrating Ohi Day. Uh, it's a Greek holiday. Uh, the ship was in the Greek Navy for 40 years. It's when uh, the Greek prime minister said no, basically, to um, uh, Mussolini, and then war started. Uh, so it's celebrated every year, so we're going to have a little commemoration at the, the ship tomorrow morning. Uh, something we are very excited for, November November 12th, 4 p.m. Uh, those of you who know the band Sabaton, uh-huh. they, they have created a movie, and they are only releasing it at history museums across the world. Huh? And That's as cool. of right now, the Slater is the only museum in New York State that will be showing this movie. The only way to see this movie is to go to a museum. That's um, cool. We I've are close. Heard- That's great. Yeah, this is something just was announced. Um, we're only doing it on the November 12th as of right now. We're almost sold out on the tickets. It's $15. You'll see the movie. you see the ship, popcorn, all that. Um, if we do sell out on tickets and then there's more interest, we'll do another date. Uh, so we're looking forward to doing that. And then, um, yeah, we're closing up shop here in about four weeks. And then what are you personally going to be doing during the winter? When, when you guys close up shop, then what, what, what do you typically do? Um, various collection projects. Um, right now, uh, I actually messaged Tim last week. Uh, or they made a video four or five months ago creating archival boxes for their charts. Uh, we have a bunch of blueprints rolled up, uh, but no boxes. So creating boxes for that, uh, cataloging blueprints. Um, speaking of dry dock for all you guys, you know what would be a very fun episode? What's that? Having Tim Rizzuto and Ed Zikowski on here talking about dry docking. Agreed. That, that, be would, be, that would be gold. Uh, I don't um, think that would happen. So. Well, wait, I heard you talk about Rizzuto. Who was the other guy? Ed Zukowski. He's he's a very sweet, loving, kind old man. Yeah, um, big teddy bear. You just want to hug him. With cactus-like thorns. Oh, okay. <laughs> Sarcasm. All right, got it. Tim Tim calls him the um, foremost expert on destroyers in the world. But, uh, he's kind of Tim's mentor. He is. Oh, yeah. no. They've, been, oh, they've no. been together for yeah. 45 years, 50 years. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. Would, that would make him my grand mentor, which he doesn't like hearing. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right. Uh, let's see. Uh, so for any of you that want to check out the Slater's content on YouTube, definitely uh, enter USS Slater in the search bar on YouTube, and you're going to come up with their stuff. Thank you, for uh, Connor, for throwing that across the bottom. They've got a lot of great content. You can also check them out, ussslater.org. Anything you want to add, oh. Mr. Epp? Um, I'll save it for a future episode. What? Oh, I'll save it for a future episode. All right, fine. I'd okay. like to build on something that um, John, John mentioned there a second ago, You're talking okay. about the Greek heritage of his ship. Uh, just very recently, we've had some encouraging news that the Greeks who own the fourth surviving Fletcher, the Velos, Charette, Velos, might be interested. Finally, here toward the end, in participating in our 80th anniversary celebrations. So oh. we're going to see if we can draw the Greeks in and uh, see what they can show us about their Fletcher. How did you hey guys, finally? I hear- never saw any pictures of uh, you guys flying a shamrock flag. Did you guys do that? Oh no, I. I've got pictures of the kid with the shamrock shamrock yeah, flag. Oh, good. Okay, I just haven't seen any. <laughs> yeah. No, I'm sorry. We thought yeah, it's, you know, a- it's a shamrock flag. You know what those look like. <laughs> I, actually, somebody from Buffalo commented on it on on Facebook. I thought it was Fabulous. you. Thanks, guys. I just I just never heard what happened with that, and I that was the night my internet was really bad. So ah, okay. Just, uh, but no, that's great. Um, yeah. I'll send you pictures. Thank you, Tim. And I also I'd like to. I'm echoing, I think. I'd like to mention that Tim and I are beginning to collaborate on uh, comparing our uh, the Sullivans with the kid. And so we'll be releasing videos on both our YouTube channels. Oh, yeah. uh, com- you know, uh, comparison videos where it will be half him, half I, and then uh, we'll be walking around to the same spaces on our ship. So that's really exciting. And the 
look forward to that. Well, the, yeah, that'd be a great idea because the kids more World War II set up, and then the uh, Sullivans is uh, what post World War II, more like uh, Korea, then, right? 1960, 1961, I would say, yeah. Okay. Yeah, and even even during the war, the the shipyards that the different shipyards that built the Fletcher to a common set of plans put their own spin on it. And so we're constantly finding uh, uh, differences between the Fletchers that were built in different shipyards. And this mm -hmm. is disregarding post-war configuration changes and the like. Okay. Yeah. Uh, let's see. And uh, let's see. All right. I already mentioned that. Yeah. So uh, to check out their website, USSLater.org. Connor had that up here, up there a little earlier. Thanks again, Connor. Yeah. So definitely check out their website, check out the Slater on uh, YouTube. And I haven't mentioned it tonight, but I always like to say that one of the best ways to support operations like the kid, like the Slater, like the Buffalo Naval Park is simply get on YouTube and watch their videos. Um, it helps to build up their subscriber base, viewership, all of those little things go towards YouTube being able to kick back dollars, you know, now that their channels are able to monetize to earn revenue that way. So definitely if, if, if you can't, you know, do any kind of donation on their website, check out their content on YouTube, watch their videos, click subscribe. One of the simplest yet most effective ways to throw support behind these guys. All right, moving on to... The Alexander Henry in Thunder Bay. All that's right. It. Go for it, yeah. Connor. That's a nice uh, pleasure. Yeah. Yeah, I feel like I'm the awkward one out here tonight. Uh, so uh, this – someone sent me a message there. Never mind. Uh, so basically what's happened here on the ship is this last week we completed our last – uh, official event of the season, which is Haunted Harbor, which is uh, basically mm. turned two decks into a haunted house. And uh, that's been done. We actually just had the final operations board meeting of the season yesterday. Uh, so that was quite a relief to have that done. But now we are moving into basically uh, winterizing the ship. I think they were actually doing some of that today. Uh, prepping the displays for shutdown, for lack of a better word, and just we're going to spend the next five months basically doing a bunch of the paperwork and other things that we haven't had time to do this summer. Uh, this has been a very transformative year for our organization. I mentioned it to some of you guys at Hinza this year that uh, we saw a lot of changes in our staff, and we had the big name change this year, and the big news, and I can finally talk about this, the Alexander Henry is now the latest uh, historic site in Canada. It is now a protected heritage site within the country. So the ship itself is now protected. Uh, this was a process that was started by former chief engineer Dave Benedict, who uh, started the process in 2017 before we even got the ship. And... Uh, it's finally complete and now we're in the process of selecting where the plaque will go and looking at what opportunities that will open up for us in the future because mm -hmm. with our new partnership with uh hopefully a new partnership with the cruise ships coming into the new tourist season uh we should have a great year next year and everything's looking great going forward um we are also looking because we did bring up youtube we are looking at that potentially for next year uh the plan was for this year but uh things just got in the way i'm sure you all can appreciate a project i'm gonna be putting the back burner uh and then really that's about it uh we're just done the season i know some of our guys are going to take two weeks off and then we're just going to hit back at it with the more white collar stuff and prep for next year i'm kind of jealous of the guys down in louisiana who get to open all year round but <laughs> at the same time our ship doesn't have heat or running water so i think mm. we're fine for the season mm -hmm. uh yeah now we're just waiting for the ice to start showing up when it uh when it comes to youtube just take your phone around start shooting video of different parts of the 
mm -hmm. the Henry and just post them on YouTube. Just get started, you know, yeah. just hit, hit record. And uh, I'd love to see whatever you come up with. Yeah, um, I've uh, I'm I've we they had that YouTube thing at Hinza this year where they talked about stuff like that. And I took notes mm -hmm. and uh, I'll be talking with you, Ken, in the next six months or, though, or so. Any any time, any help I can give you, just let me sure know. Thing. Um, oh, actually, one more thing, quickly. Go for it. Uh, we're already planning next year's big events because uh, it takes that long. Uh, we are probably going to have another Coast Guard Day this year, or next year in 2024. Uh, what the theme will be this year, we do not know, but uh, we're looking forward to that, and we're looking forward to continuing that event as well because that was our big news story outside of the heritage status and haunted harbor so that'll be something we're planning out too and i think i'm going to be sitting on that pretty shortly and we'll have a few more uh a few more things coming up so if anyone wants to keep in contact or just keep following us we are at the transportation museum of thunder bay on both facebook and instagram so you can uh follow us there and that is our website tmtb.ca and we will be actually updating that website in the next two months or so uh, to make it more uh, usable with uh, phones because we had a few people commenting on that this year. So, yeah, that's everything. And the uh, one thing I want to say, you know, it's, it's great to have Connor, you know, working behind the scenes, you know, of these live broadcasts that we do. But he is also one of the administrators of yeah. the Museum Ships Facebook group. And mm -hmm. I strongly encourage people that if they haven't checked the, the Museum Ships Facebook group, out on facebook definitely do there's i probably say at least 10 posts a day in that group and it's all fascinating stuff uh so definitely check out uh connor's work on facebook of course you know with him uh you are now the curator right at, yes uh, i am and is that is that strictly for the alexander henry or is that for the transportation museum it's for the museum as a whole uh obviously the henry is our largest artifact and because we do not have a building yet uh, mm -hmm. that, that means that it is also, uh, our museum, but yes, I, uh, I am, uh, responsible for the artifacts on board and I shared it to you guys in our private chat recently, but I was digging through our original blueprints the other night. So mm -hmm. that'll be stuff, fun stuff to be, uh, mm -hmm. digging through in the next six months. Mm -hmm. All right. And that website, one more time, www.tmtb standing for transportation of thunder bay transportation, transportation museum. museum of thunder bay dot ca yes all right uh anything else you guys want to add before we shut this down nope all good right good discussion look forward to them in the future and we have one more uh 80th anniversary celebration which happens to be on new year's eve so uh right is it new year's eve or yeah, is it the, the commission yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Should, yeah. 31 december Mm -hmm. All right, so we might we'll, we'll talk about that. But for all the fans, we hope mm -hmm. that uh, you uh, can join us again uh, for that celebration of the Cass and Young. So. Yeah, yeah, uh, and you know we've got a few episodes that'll occur between now and then, so we'll be able to talk about that some more. Uh, I wanted a uh, special thanks to Victor Vescovo for coming on tonight. It you know I mean he's a big deal to me so I I was I was thrilled to to have him join us and and to give us as much time as he did yes. so uh, definitely want to say thanks to Victor uh, thanks to uh, Tim Parks Shane uh, John Connor for uh, you know being there for this episode I don't, I just really had a lot of fun with this tonight I know it went long I also want to say thanks to a lot of you viewers that uh, stuck with us. Uh, can't do this if we don't have viewers. So viewers, subscribers, thank you for joining us tonight. My name is Ken Stano with the YouTube channel History X. You can also check me out, historyxchannel.com. Thanks, everybody, for watching, and I hope everyone has a good night. Good night. Thanks, good night, everyone. Good night. Good night. And